Chapter 24 Zeke Olson felt the speed of the vintage 1960s hearse slow after what seemed like hours. Hours since the men whisked him away from the safe house after executing the contracts they'd brought for him to sign. The long ride had made his butt sore and his mouth dry. Plus, he wasn't sure where he was since the windows on the vehicle were completely blacked out, keeping light from entering or exiting. For the past 30 minutes, his nose detected the woody smell of birch and the distinctive freshness of mountain air as the vehicle's suspension creaked and groaned during its travels over uneven roads and three cattle guards. The armed two-man escort team had told him nothing about their destination other than it would take some time to get there. Even though he was the newly minted owner and CEO of Indigo Technologies, he respected their silence not pushing for answers. The hearse came to a full stop, and a few seconds later, the side door opened. Light hit his eyes, making him blink. He put up his hands until his pupils adjusted, allowing him to see more clearly. The light had a yellow tint, indicating it was artificial, which seemed appropriate now that musty, damp air was entering his lungs. So much for the clean air of the forest, he thought. He'd been around Vito Indigo long enough to know the billionaire loved his secrets, especially out-of-the-way safe houses and underground facilities. Zeke should have expected nothing less from this new location. He slid his aging frame out of the car and found a few layers of crushed granite rock at his feet. His eyes darted left and right, taking in as many details as his brain could absorb in a few seconds. He was in a darkened cave about 50 yards wide and just as deep, probably inside a mountain and far away from civilization. A man approached in a tailored blue suit and held out his hand. When his coat opened from the extended arm movement, Zeke spotted a handgun strapped to his belt line in a conceal-and-carry holster. Welcome to Route Cellar 1, Mr. Olson. I'm Indigo Tech's lead counsel and chief strategist, Calder Stanton. Zeke shook his hand, wondering what Root Cellar 1 meant. Plus, there was the whole lead counsel and chief strategist thing. He wasn't sure what to make of that odd combination for a job title. But let's face it, he was dealing with a staff built by his former boss and flamboyant entrepreneur, Vito Indigo, so none of it should come as a shock or a surprise. Since the word one had been tacked on the end of the facility's name, he knew there were more of these root sellers, whatever that meant. The pleasure is all mine, Mr. Stanton. Glad to be here, wherever here is. All in due time, sir. First, we need to get you settled. Then we'll need to address several pressing matters that need your attention as CEO. Sounds good, but I don't have any luggage or unpacking to do. I was brought here directly and never had the chance to grab my things. Not to worry, sir. We've taken care of that for you. Your clothes and some personal possessions are waiting for you in the presidential suite, Stanton said, holding out a hand in the direction of a door in front of them. Please, follow me. Zeke nodded and followed two steps behind the attorney as they left the cave and entered the seven-foot-tall door made of metal. A powerful downdraft of air washed over him as soon as they cleared the doorway. Then the smell of the air changed. It was no longer musty and damp. It was dry and stale, indicating he was in a climate-controlled environment with low humidity. He figured it was about 72 degrees as they walked down a long hallway, reminding him of a perfect December day he enjoyed while attending a business conference in Phoenix, Arizona a few years prior. Above him were strings of evenly spaced lights, and the walls and ceiling looked to be made of stainless steel, much like the door they'd just passed through. His reflection stared back at him on both sides, each distorted in both height and width like a funhouse mirror. The place was spotless, even the tan-colored floor, which felt rigid and thick. He figured it was decorative concrete since it had a brushed, finished look, obviously built by some fashion architect. There must have been 200 sweeping letters stenciled into the surface, stretching between him and the far end of the corridor. The alternating capital letters were done in longhand script, showing cursive I's and T's the entire way. Next up was an elevator that only traveled down, 
nine stories to be exact. Zeke stood behind the attorney as the lift took them to the bottom floor, labeled SL9. They got out and made a sharp right, then a left, where they ran into a pair of well-dressed, burly men standing at attention next to a set of double mahogany doors. His eyes found more cursive capital letters carved into the wood, a V on the left and an I on the right. Each letter was done in white and sitting inside a looping open circle, also done in white. Welcome to your new home, Stanton said, pushing the doors open from the middle and walking through. I trust you'll find these accommodations satisfactory. Holy shit, Zeke said, not thinking before speaking. His eyes flew wide as his brain took in the stunning details waiting for him inside. The place was enormous, with plush furniture and decorations in every direction. It looked like something out of the styles of the Rich and Famous show that used to be on TV when he was a kid. I take that as a yes, Stanton said, turning and making eye contact. Zeke nodded. Yes, definitely. Wow. Two maids stood in the back, only a few feet in front of a wall covered in abstract paintings. Both women were fit, blonde, and in their twenties, wearing traditional black and white French maid uniforms and showing stunning white-toothed smiles. Three freakishly tall, slender men in chef's attire waited by a door on the right. Their dark complexions and distinctive cheekbones made them look medieval, especially their deep-set eyes. The door behind them looked to be a swinging entrance, since there wasn't a knob, only a metal push plate. He assumed the doorway led to the kitchen. Each of the chefs gave him a formal bow, obviously showing respect and saying hello. Gentlemen, he said, giving them an eye flare and a head nod. He wondered how their tall white hats stayed attached when they bent over. On the left was a sprawling, built-in entertainment center that covered the wall from end to end. He counted 12 flat-screen TVs arranged in a tight 4x3 pattern in the center. Indigo Tech's logo was spinning across the massive digital array, almost as if it was in screensaver mode. The rest of the entertainment unit was stuffed with expensive-looking electronic gear with blinking lights. He'd hit the frickin' jackpot and couldn't wait to see what it all did. It would probably take him a week just to learn how to operate it all. Stanton cleared his throat. If you'd like to have a shower to freshen up, you'll find the master suite quite luxurious. I have two meetings to attend, then I'll be back to collect you. Okay, Calder, I'll be ready. Which way is it? Through the kitchen. I'll send for Miss Shelby to help you get acquainted with your new surroundings. Miss Shelby? A personal assistant of sorts. I understand her massage therapy treatments are excellent. Zeke smiled, quietly thanking Indigo for this amazing gift. Chapter 25 Director of National Intelligence Nancy Wiggins stood behind the junior communications officer who was busy working with the video feed integration system in the front row of the massive command and control center of Site R also known as the Raven Rock Mountain Complex. The tech's hands worked quickly, re-establishing the video feeds as quickly as the site's two-man maintenance crews could bring them back online. The pale-skinned kid looked over his shoulder and made eye contact with her. She wasn't sure why, but she nodded at the nervous, acne-covered teenager, sending an assertive, job-well-done message with her eyes. The tech seemed to appreciate her vote of confidence, turning his head back to the equipment, blinking across the impressive control board. She couldn't believe that with all the technology and brain pans supporting this secret facility in Pennsylvania, nobody remembered to shield the external cameras from a possible EMP strike. It was beyond stupid, but reality nonetheless. The underground installation was only a handful of miles from Camp David and featured a subterranean tunnel between the two locations. She had been briefed on both and knew most of the rooms in each facility had been carefully shielded and hardened against EMP strikes. However, to her complete shock and amazement, the surveillance equipment outside hadn't been. Who forgets something like that? Men do, that's who.
she quipped to herself quietly, too busy scratching themselves and puffing out their sagging chests before the next testosterone contest. Senior members of the president's administration would be arriving soon, as well as scores of sitting senators and representatives from in and around Washington. Site R needed to finish its repairs and restore full operations before they did. Otherwise, the continuity of government would be at risk. The facts staring her in the face made the threat all too real. Someone had orchestrated the Red Rain event and its subsequent EMP bursts. She and General Rawlings figured it was Jeffrey Hansen, a man who had fallen off the grid since the weather was first unleashed. Whether it was Hansen or someone else really didn't matter. She worried that whoever was behind the plot may have set off the EMP bursts for the sole purpose of forcing a central gathering of senior members of the world's most powerful nation. If she was correct, it was a precursor for a secondary, more lethal attack an attack she knew would most likely happen after the dignitaries and their families arrived, and did so according to the government's Night Watch Protocol, a well-documented set of steps and procedures that any competent hacker could find if they knew where to look. Given everything that had happened recently, she had to assume the person behind the EMP attack had the skills and the motivation to use their Night Watch playbook against them. Only a moron would be blind to the chess pieces being strategically positioned on the board. She knew that someone with the knowledge and resources to build and deploy a global doomsday weather device could certainly penetrate the aging systems at the Pentagon and the White House. With the government's budget shortfall mounting year after year, deep cutbacks had to be made, leaving the most experienced systems engineers and security experts unemployed. That meant rookie coders and recent college grads were running the place. A scary thought, to say the least. Not an hour before, she'd raised these same concerns to the supervisory team in charge of Site R, but they scoffed at her and terminated the meeting in a huff. Not that she could blame them. What she was suggesting was far-reaching and almost beyond belief. Then toss in President Cooper's murderous actions at the White House, and she could understand why everyone was on edge and scrambling, especially the men. The tension in the room was palpable, with each communications and security officer talking into their headsets while their hands worked the controls at their station. The feverish activity would look impressive to an outsider who might be standing on the observation catwalk located behind the massive command and control room. But she knew the truth. Those hands belonged to men trying to cover their asses. She wasn't in charge, but thought she ought to be. Sometimes men were so enamored by their own sense of self-worth and self-proclaimed intellectual superiority that they forget the simplest things, like putting the seat down after draining their bladder or remembering to shield the cameras outside. The very same cameras that were tasked as the eyes and ears for a complex that could be facing an imminent threat. Then again, men were responsible for forgetting to code the most basic security measures into the country's failed Obamacare healthcare website and the sister project, the IntelliWeb, the private network used by each branch of clandestine services to share and process information. The massive ISIS breach of 2018 was legendary and should have been a hard lesson learned, but unfortunately, it was quickly forgotten as history marched forward. DC's virtual rug must have been bulging at the seams with all the skeletons that had been swept under it over the years. The public had no clue what had happened or what was stolen, and the men in charge at the time wanted it kept that way. Some of those same men were standing in the C&C with her, trying to conceal their failures again. She held back a grin, wanting to keep her self-amusement from the testosterone sacks buzzing in the room. If you want the job done right, hire a woman. She'll dot the I's and cross the T's. Count on it. Excuse me, director, a tall young tech with deep blue eyes and a lopsided haircut said, turning sideways and cutting in front of her as he made his way to his workstation on the right. He glanced back, giving her one of those what-the-hell-is-she-doing-here looks. He wasn't wearing a name tag, so she couldn't make a note of his name, However, a nameless ID badge was hanging from his pocket with his picture ID, 
a barcode, and a number, 3309. She smiled, not wanting to give the young mouth breather the satisfaction. The kid quickly turned away, sitting down and aiming his focus at the controls in front of him. How much longer before we are fully operational? She asked the video feed operator seated in front of her. We? He said with attitude. She shot him a look with pinched eyes. If I had to guess, 45 minutes, give or take? You're going to have to do better than that. The first arrivals will be here any minute, she said, wondering why General Rawlings had broken away from his escort team. He should have been standing there with her, raising hell and showing solidarity against the incompetence dominating the room. I'm doing the best I can, Director, but there are literally hundreds of feeds across the site that we need to restore and check. This is going to take some time. Time we don't have, she said, looking up at the massive video board along the front wall of the command center. The center screen changed, showing six ancient round-top school buses approaching with faded paint, wobbly tires, and cracked windows. Behind them were two dump trucks full of people. They, too, were models from the 60s and puffing out thick black smoke from their twin exhaust risers. You've got to be kidding me. It's all we could find that still worked, the tech answered, his hands working the control board. Before she could take another breath, the rows of fluorescent lights buzzed and flickered along the ceiling. Then a series of pops rang out as sparks began to fall. The display consoles and view screens across the control room jittered once, then twice, then three times before they blinked out entirely. An instant later, the power failed inside the command center, sending the room into complete darkness. What the hell is going on? She yelled into the void, hoping someone would answer. She heard the tech in front of her spin around in his squeaky chair, which she assumed was to respond to her question. However, before he could speak, sparks began to erupt across the room, seemingly in every direction. Then, a moment later, zigzagging bolts of energy shot out from equipment in the front of the room, jumping from station to station. She stood frozen, watching a wave of power streaks zap some of the men, then bounce around the room, hitting various officers and staff in the chests and heads. The lightning seemed to be moving with purpose, starting in the front row and moving systematically from there. The tech in front of her grabbed her hands. Get down, he yelled, pulling her to the deck. She felt a sharp sting in her lower back while the energy storm filled the room with brilliant flashes of light. She buried her head in her arms as the sounds of zap and sizzle dominated her ears. Strike after strike was heard as the energy storm found flesh and metal. Chapter 26 Wicks held out her hand as Wyatt finished tossing the last scoop of muddy dirt into the grave, then gave her his shovel. Simon and Slayer did the same, and she carried theirs along with hers inside the lone barn still standing at Jericho. She put the four tools against the wall next to several 50-gallon metal drums, keeping a close eye on the roof line above. Somehow, it was still intact, even though two wall sections had been damaged by the attack. Some of the roof had fallen in on itself, but the rest of the stubborn structure was still alive and kicking, just like her wounded brother. She and the rest of the group had been silent while the graves were dug, filled with bodies and covered up again. Nobody said anything, probably because there were no words for what had happened. She went back outside the barn and stood next to her brother, putting an arm around him. Do you want to say a few words? She said, hoping he'd make it quick. She knew he was hurting, both emotionally and physically. She looked down at his shirt and saw that the redness had spread, turning an even darker shade across the cloth. Wyatt dropped to a knee and bent down to put his palms on two of the mounds. He coughed, then cleared his throat. He began to speak, his voice thready and full of grief. Brothers for life, and my life for my brothers. I'm sorry I failed you, but I swear to God, I won't rest until I find whoever did this and make them pay. Wicks waited, but no more words came across her brother's lips. She leaned down, rubbing her hand on his back. We need to go, Wyatt. It's time. 
He nodded, then got to his feet with her help. Wyatt turned to Simon. Inside the barn are some crates with weapons and ammo from the UPS shipment. There's a ton of stuff, more than we can carry, but we should grab what we can. You never know what we might need. Simon shook his head. We'll gear up, but you're going to rest until we get you to the hospital. Gonna be a long walk, Slayer said with attitude. No, I'm fine, Wyatt answered, taking a slow, grimacing step forward with Wicks supporting him. Then his eyes pinched and he stopped moving. What do you mean, walk? You don't know? Slayer asked in a curious tone. Know what? Right before the rain dissipated, there were a series of bursts, Simon answered. Yeah, I heard them, Wyatt said. Me too, made my ears ring, Wicks added, feeling her brother getting heavier as they walked. I'm not talking about the sounds. I'm talking about the massive light show, then the release of energy, Simon told them. Slayer looked at Wicks. Remember those microwave emitters G found that had been shipped to the cell towers? She nodded through her look of confusion. They lit up the sky like Vegas. We think they supercharged the atmosphere and sent off a bunch of EMPs. What? She asked, trying to understand. She looked at Simon. Is that true? We think so. It looks like all the equipment in the area was affected. At least the stuff we checked, Simon said. And probably across the globe, Slayer blurted out. Go ahead, Red. Tell him the cool part. Tell us what? Wicks asked, swinging her head to Simon. Slayer answered instead. Everything started floating in the air. Even us. It was totally unbelievable. So it wasn't just me? She mumbled in a low voice, remembering what happened after she entered the kitchen. I'm sorry, what was that? Slayer asked, leaning forward with an ear turned at her. Never mind. So what does this all mean? It means we're walking. Old school like, Slayer told her, looking at Simon. Nothing is going to work, right, Simon? No power, no cars, no computers, no nothing. That would be my guess. EMPs? Seriously? Wyatt asked, his voice a little weaker than before. I'm afraid so, Simon answered. Damn it, I knew it, Wyatt said, breathing heavier than before. I knew they were up to something. They wanted this. This was their plan the whole time. Who's they? Slayer asked. The government? Those cock-sucking liars in Washington? Let's slow down a minute. We really don't know who caused this, Simon said in a calm, even voice. I think it's better if we not jump to conclusions. So what do we do now? Wicks asked, making eye contact with everyone. Now we head east to my neighbor's farm, Wyatt answered. Simon nodded. I saw it on the way in, one of the Amish farms, am I right? Yep, the Fishers, Wyatt answered. I don't think that's such a good idea. If they're like my Amish neighbors, they won't want outsiders on their property, Wick said. Mine will. We made friends with their order last year when TJ and I helped find one of their toddlers who wandered off in the middle of the night. If we hadn't found her when we did, she would have died of exposure. So what are you thinking? Horse and buggy? Slayer asked him. Yeah, they owe me. Big time. Plus one of them is a country doctor. We met him when me and TJ found the little girl. Even if you're friends, I'm guessing they won't want us showing up armed, Simon said. No, you're right. We can dump the weapons in the woods just beyond their property line. It starts on the other side of Big Bug Creek. We'll need to speak with Brother Isaac. He's the senior elder of the Fisher family. Though, I heard a rumor he had a nasty stroke recently. It was his granddaughter Emma who wandered off and nearly froze to death. Wicks kept her arms on Wyatt as he moved, preparing to argue with him, but before she could get the words out, his body went limp. She couldn't keep him upright, falling to her knees in the mud with Wyatt hanging in her arms. His head fell back against her shoulder, showing her a pair of eyes full of white with no pupils. Somebody help me! She screamed. Chapter 27 Director Wiggins rolled herself over and stood up in the control room of Site R, fighting through the pain in her lower back. The lightning storm was finally over, but she couldn't see much else other than flames burning at some of the stations. The power was out, and men were down everywhere after taking strikes of energy to their chests and heads. 
The technician in front of her was stirring, but had a scorch mark across his back. The same acne-covered young officer who'd saved her life a few minutes earlier. She grabbed the woozy kid by the shirt collar and pulled him to his feet. Her back pain was worse than it had been in weeks, obviously tweaked when the kid yanked her to the ground. But she needed to press on and ignore it. Smoke was filling the room, and she knew it wouldn't be long before the oxygen was depleted. She planned to get the injured tech out first, then come back and see who else was alive and drag them to safety too. Come on, we need to get you out of here, she told the kid, using the ambient light from the fires to locate a path to the exit door. She wrapped her arm around the young man and escorted him forward. The room was littered with injured men. Some slumped over in their chairs, while others were lying in a heap on the floor. From what she could see, each had a wicked burn mark where the lightning struck. Another pair of hands and feet came from the right. Here, let me help you, a man's voice said. Wiggins felt the injured kid's arm lift and his weight decrease as another person joined the rescue effort. Wiggins coughed from the smoke burning her lungs, then leaned forward to look across the body of the wounded man, hoping to get a look at the helper. He was tall and wearing a uniform, but other than that, she couldn't see a face. The trek continued until they made it to the exit door, a red-colored metal door with a heavy steel knob. She twisted it and yanked, pulling the door open. The helper let go of the injured man, allowing her to turn sideways and usher the kid outside. She put him on the ground, with his back against the wall. His eyes looked up at her, his voice slow and shaky. Thanks, director. I owe you one. She nodded. I'll be back in a flash. Gotta see if anyone else is alive. When she turned for the door, her face ran smack into the chest of the tall helper. His hands were out, keeping her from moving. I got it from here, director, he said, looking at her with deep blue eyes and a strong chin. She recognized the officer. It was the same man who'd given her the nasty look earlier when he sped by on the way to his station, ID badge 3309. His uniform was clean, and there wasn't a mark on him. Lucky bastard. Zeke Olson walked alongside Indigo Tech's lead attorney, Calder Stanton, as they made their way from the central bank of elevators in the secret location known as Root Cellar 1. They'd been walking for at least 15 minutes and passed through a number of long corridors, leaving him impressed with the size and scope of the complex. However, thus far, he hadn't seen a single person other than Stanton and the armed guards outside his stateroom. On the right, were a series of open areas, some with brightly colored couches and chairs, all of them empty. Other areas contained what looked like single-person sleeping pods with thick mattress pads and futuristic-looking domes hanging over the top. He visually checked their interiors, but didn't see any arms or legs sticking out at the ends. They, too, were empty. On his left was a never-ending series of closed doors, each with an Indigo Tech logo near the top and some symbol-based stenciling he did not recognize. Each symbol had a Matrix-style set of dots underneath it, like what was used in Braille writing. Above the dots was an unusual symbol, reminding him of Japanese cuneiform. However, the symbol wasn't a symmetry of wedged-shaped black lines showing a pictogram. No, these looked more like an array of directional arrows crisscrossing each other at random angles. Each one he passed looked unique from the others, leading him to believe they were some type of company alphabet that he wasn't familiar with, at least not yet. Zeke added another item to his mental to-do list, learn door symbol markers. A growing to-do list he planned to tackle as soon as he felt confident that he was fully in charge of all things Indigo Technologies and respected by the staff. A heartbroken staff who'd just lost their amazing leader in a horrible plane crash. Zeke wanted to give everyone a chance to get over their loss and feel comfortable with him as the new CEO before he started barking orders. Did Shelby help you get settled? Calder asked, pushing open a door that led to yet another connecting hallway. Yeah, nice young gal, 
a little quiet and a bit on the skinny side, but her hands were magic, if you know what I mean. Calder turned his head as he walked, showing an upturned lip along the side of his mouth. Yes, I hear she is, though she's never been assigned to me, so I can't speak from personal experience. I'm curious, Stanton, did she provide the same personal services for Vito when he was alive? I can't speak to that, but let me say you're not the first person to take up residence in that suite over the years. Zeke nodded, feeling a stir in his loins. He wondered what other services Shelby might be able to help him with. He knew her hands were gifted, but what about the rest of the cute, attentive woman? He smiled, feeling like a dirty old man, but he didn't care. It seemed appropriate somehow, now that he was CEO and majority stockholder of the massively profitable technology giant. There were bound to be plenty of perks for the richest man in the world, and he figured Shelby was the first of many. He put another item on the to-do list, a personal item this time. It involved Shelby, a bottle of wine, and a little reciprocal servicing behind closed doors. His eyes found Calder's. Now that I'm the owner, do I have access to everything across the board? Calder didn't answer, though his eyes did narrow a bit. Zeke took the look to mean that the man wanted him to clarify. What I mean is, do I have access to all the areas of the company in this complex? And do I get to make all the final decisions, or am I simply a figurehead around here? Interesting questions, sir. May I ask why you feel the need to ask them? After all... You are the new CEO and majority stockholder. Well, that may be true on paper, but so far I feel like a pampered prisoner. That's a curious term. Yeah, I'm not sure how else to put it. Your armed men show up unannounced, have me sign papers, then bring me here in a vehicle with its windows blacked out. Right now, I have no idea where I am, and it seems as though I'm not allowed to ask. But it doesn't stop there. As soon as I arrive... You whisk me away and dump me in a huge presidential suite with a couple of armed no-necks outside. Then, to my complete shock and amazement, you send in hired help to... How do I put this? To give me a rub and tug. Granted, it did relax me quite nicely, but that's not really my point here. What I want to say is that now you're leading me around this root cellar like a rat in a maze. A giant empty maze with no one else around almost like you're intentionally trying to get me lost for some reason. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Olson, but let me assure you, we take your personal security very seriously and we'll work tirelessly to make sure your time here is comfortable and expeditious. Okay, I'm not sure what all that means, but thanks, Zeke said with a quick tongue and a roll of the eyes. That's what I'm here for, Mr. Olson. Up ahead is the data center. Would you like to see it? Sure, why not? Zeke said, throwing up his arms. He had to give the man credit. Stanton was smooth. The lawyer avoided every question like a pro, and then changed the subject without missing a beat. Zeke wasn't sure what was going on, but it was clear he was being manipulated. To what end, he didn't know. He put a few more items on the to-do list, items he planned to knock off in private when he was away from the prying eyes of the staff. The door to the data center swung open under the power of Calder's right hand. Zeke stepped in front and went inside, his feet landing on the metal grate of a catwalk located high in the corner of an open room. His jaw dropped when his vision fed his brain a sweeping view of the area before him. The room was massive, at least the size of ten super Walmarts sitting side by side, all under one roof. He looked, but didn't see a single support column anywhere. An amazing piece of engineering. The expanse seemed to stretch on for at least a mile, with row after row of hardware racks brimming with blinking equipment. The sound of the humming equipment was nearly deafening, echoing off the walls of the enormous data center. Welcome to Root Cellar 1, the attorney yelled after leaning in close to Zeke's ear. This is the central core of the internet. From here, we can monitor, store, and process every shred of information across the planet. Chapter 28 
How's Wyatt doing? Simon asked Wicks when she looked his way. His breathing is okay, but the fever seems to be getting worse, she said, wiping a damp cloth on her brother's forehead. Plus, I think the wound is starting to bleed again. Try to keep pressure on it, Simon told her. Okay, but you guys really need to hurry. We're working as fast as we can, Slayer said, working on the construction of the pull-behind cargo sled. He tied a length of paracord around a sawed-off two-by-four, then looped the lashing under and around before double-wrapping it again. He cinched it tightly to the second of the two poles that would establish the primary support frame for the triangle-shaped travoy. The travoy hadn't been difficult to build with the scrap materials they'd found on Wyatt's property. They'd started with two wooden fence rails and used a quick whittle of Slayer's knife and a few swipes of 60-grit sandpaper to carve out usable handholds. Then they added a trio of 2 by 4s for cross supports. All that was left to add was the canvas tarp to the center of the triangle-shaped frame. They'd chosen to attach all the pieces with paracord instead of nails or screws for two reasons, speed and safety. Using cordage as lashing material meant faster assembly and eliminated sharp objects that could potentially tear open Wyatt's skin or rip a hole in the canvas. The neighbor's farm was a good distance away, and they'd be traveling on foot over uneven ground, magnifying the impact of sharp objects. Slayer looked at Simon. Do you think we need another cross piece? I'm not sure this will be strong enough to support his weight. No, we don't need it. I've built several of these before, and what we have should be plenty. It's all about the physics of weight distribution across an inclined plane, Simon said, pointing. Let's get that canvas sized and attached. Slayer used a razor knife he found in the barn to slice up the tarp and size it to the same dimensions as the travoy. Then he grabbed a leather punch he'd scavenged from the tool bench in the corner and knocked out a dozen or so tie-down holes along the perimeter of the material, reinforcing each with duct tape. Simon held the tarp in place while Slayer's fingers made quick work of attaching it to the frame. It only took a couple of minutes. Slayer pointed to a rusty lawnmower sitting in the corner. What if we use those wheels? Wouldn't it be easier to roll it? Not with all the mud after the rain. They'll sink in and be useless. There's a reason these are designed with poles and not wheels, especially when the trip is cross-country. Yeah, but most people use a plow horse. This is gonna suck. We'll take turns, Simon said, knowing that they couldn't stick around Jericho much longer. The men who attacked the compound might return, and Wyatt's condition was deteriorating. For both reasons, there wasn't time to go to the Amish and borrow a horse and wagon. They needed to leave now. The three of them worked together to lift Wyatt onto the makeshift cargo pole, putting his head nearest to the front at the high point of the canvas deck. His feet would dangle to the rear. Okay, who's first? Slayer asked. I nominate you, Wick said. Me? Yeah, brawn before beauty, she said. No, I'll start, Simon said, grabbing Slayer's arm to stop him. Simon stepped in front of the travoy, grabbing the tapered ends of the crisscrossed poles and lifting it from the ground. You relieve me when we get to the creek. But you don't even know how far it is, Slayer said. That's where you're wrong. It's only a few miles. You would have known that too if you were paying attention on the way in. We're going to have to work on your situational awareness skills. Okay, sure. Whatever you say, Red. I'll add it to the list, the kid said with a smirk. The first part of the trip went smoothly, thanks to mostly level ground, until they reached the wooded area on the far side of Wyatt's property. Then the travel slowed until they made it through the forest and came upon the Big Bug Creek, where Simon stopped to catch his breath. The travoy had worked, carrying Wyatt safely, but leaving two heavy drag marks in the muddy soil along the way. If Simon had to do it over again, and if he had the extra time to build it, he would have added additional wood under the ends of the poles to act as skids. Then the poles wouldn't have dug into the mud and would have been easier to pull behind. So now what? Slayer asked, looking at the rushing water in the creek. The white caps were pronounced and the boulders plenty. Now we check the bank and look for the narrowest point to cross. You head downstream and I'll check upstream. Meet me back here. Do we really have time for this? Wicks asked, looking down at her brother with worried eyes. We don't have a choice, Simon said. 
We can't cross here. I'm guessing you want me to stay and keep an eye on Wyatt, Wick said. Yes, keep him comfortable as best you can, Simon said, handing Wicks a pistol. She took it and held it flat in her hand, shooting a look of confusion his way. What's this for? If something happens, fire three shots into the air and we'll come running. Oh, okay, three shots, got it, she said, kneeling down next to Wyatt, who was still unconscious and lying on the sled. But please hurry. Chapter 29 Jeffrey Hansen stood up from the deck of the cargo hold of the oil tanker when he heard a few clanking sounds coming from above, then a reverberating ping as if someone had just hit their head with a frying pan. He peered into the darkness, waiting for more sound to find him while trapped deep in the belly of the massive ship. It did, sounding like metal was squeaking, almost as if a giant metal screw was slowly being removed from the wall of the ship. Hello, is anyone up there? He called out with chapped lips and a dry throat. His voice echoed off the empty walls of the ship and came back at him a second later. After another few seconds, his voice returned again, this time about half as loud. His heartbeat was already thumping hard in his chest, but it shot up a level when the squeaking stopped and was replaced with a long eek sound, and then a single clang. Light broke through the blackness above, beaming down from the now open hatch sitting atop the retracted exit stairs. Hey, I'm down here! Hello! He yelled, waiting for an answer, but a voice wasn't what he heard. Instead, the sound of footsteps found his eardrums. Someone had just walked through the hatch and onto the metal catwalk. His eyes hadn't adjusted to the sudden flood of light, leaving him to squint at the opening above. Two flashlight beams shot out, hitting the nearest wall of the cargo hold, then tracking slowly down the wall. Over here! Hansen screamed, hoping they'd hear him and turn their flashlights in his direction. The beams adjusted, sliding across the deck and coming toward him. He put his arms up like a football referee signaling a touchdown and waited for the flashlights to find his chest. They did, but they didn't stop, passing over him like a searchlight sweeping a prison yard. No, 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 right here, he told them, waving his arms and jumping up and down. The pain from his wounds was screaming at him to stop. Otherwise, the hasty movement might tear some of the stitches loose. But he was in panic mode now and wasn't going to stop, not when this might be his only chance to get out of this hole. I'm over here, he yelled again, thinking about running to the center where the beams were currently focused. But then they started moving again, and not in any specific pattern he could anticipate. If he ran now, he'd be playing catch-up, so he decided to keep his feet still and let them find him. Almost as if on cue, one of the flashlight beams swung his way again, this time landing on him. The second one did the same, doubling down on the spotlight. He waved his hands above his head, looking into the beams shining down from the catwalk above. Help me, please! Bonjour, a male's voice called out, his voice echoing with decreasing volume. Do you speak English? He yelled back, recognizing the visitor's language as French, a language he didn't speak. Oui. Je parlais anglais un petit montant. He didn't understand what the man just said, but before he could ask, the voice spoke again, this time delivering words first in French, then in English. The accent was thick. Excusez-moi. Yes, I speak English. A small amount. Oh, thank God. Can you please get me the hell out of here? Oui, one moment, the man said as one of the two flashlights broke away from him. Hansen still couldn't see much other than the remaining flashlight burning into his retinas, but he heard metal noises again, this time sounding like someone was lowering the stairs. A few minutes later, two men landed at the bottom of the metal steps and walked toward him, but not together. The shorter of the two was advancing faster, while the taller man fell back a few steps. When the lead man came closer with his heavy-duty flashlight, Hansen caught a glimpse of his blue polo shirt. The word gendarme was embroidered on it. He also saw a duty belt strapped around his waist, as well as a sidearm nestled in a holster. Shit. Cops. 
French cops. Wait a minute. French police? How could that be? The oil tanker couldn't have sailed across the Atlantic to France. Not enough time had passed. That meant he was somewhere in the Western Hemisphere, somewhere near a large land mass where Trident had been deployed, and somewhere they spoke French and had French police. Those facts ruled out the USA, Canada, and Mexico. Then the answer hit him. French Guiana in South America. He'd been there a few times, having traveled the world for business as well as leisure over the years. The officer handed him a bottle of water. What are you doing here? He asked with his thick accent. Someone grabbed me off the street, started beating me, and then just left me down here after the power went out, Hansen said, deciding to play the victim. He'd known his share of policemen over the years, and most of them had one thing in common. They got off on helping victims of a crime. And given his current circumstances, playing the victim should be an easy sell, with his face bruised and body bandaged. Plus, it was true. Well, sort of. The water bottle was warm to the touch, but he didn't care. His fingers twisted off the cap, then he put the container to his lips and took three long swigs. His throat downed the liquid quickly. Hansen didn't want to tell his rescuers too much, Otherwise, his lies would start to take on too much gravity, becoming impossible to keep straight in his head. He went with simple. Thank God you guys came along. Otherwise, I was fucked. America? Yes, born and raised. What is your name? Jeffrey? Last name? Can you please get me out of here? I can't take the smell. It's been making me sick. Last name, the policeman said again, the friendly smile fading from his lips. Hubs, Hansen said, picking a name out of the air. When the cop's eyes moved away from his for a moment, he snuck a peek at the cop's gun hand and his holster. They were far apart. Plus, the snap on the holster was still secure. Do you have ID? Hansen shook his head. No, the men who grabbed me took my wallet. The cop grabbed Hansen's elbow and tugged him forward. Hansen started to walk, taking another drink, while he studied the officer with a series of quick glances. The cop's brown hair was trimmed neatly and combed from left to right with a perfectly defined part along the side. He looked to be in fabulous shape, his chest and arms bulging against the shirt he was wearing, a shirt with no ID tag or badge. His face was thin, with no facial hair, and he was a few inches shorter than Hansen, about five and a half feet tall. One of the man's two front teeth was chipped, but otherwise he looked like a typical 30-something French cop with keen eyes and an aura of confidence. Who did this? The other man asked as Hansen and his escort approached him. Can you identify? I don't know who grabbed me, and I really didn't get a good look at them. They were wearing masks, he said, deciding to stall until he was topside and on dry land. He needed to keep them guessing until he was somewhere with multiple escape routes, somewhere where the sun was shining, the air was clean, and the ground wasn't rocking beneath his feet, somewhere where he could make his move and slip away into a crowd. The second officer was a little older and had a belly just starting to sag over his belt line. His voice was much deeper than the other guy's and his tongue sharper. Hansen wasn't sure if the man was angry or just suspicious. The line between the two was a blur. Hansen knew the answer when the taller officer's right hand moved to his hip, stopping only inches from his sidearm. How did you guys find me? Hansen asked, wanting to change the subject before the firearm cleared leather. All ships in the harbor are being searched, the taller officer said, keeping his hand on his hip. Which harbor? Hansen asked, wanting to get his bearings and keep the conversation light and moving. There were only a handful of ports in French Guiana, and he'd been to two of them. Port of Saint Laurent du Maron. Hansen visualized the quaint seaport village in South America, having been there on vacation several times before with a lady friend he'd been drilling at the time. There were several docks for both large and small vessels, and plenty of tourists around thanks to its bustling street markets, monuments, and historical areas. With Trident taking down the power grid and rendering electronics useless, local law enforcement must have their hands full. He imagined governments and local officials were scrambling, thinking some type of sweeping terrorist attack was at play. 
If Trident had done its job, communications were down, and the streets were probably filled with chaos by now. If all that were true, then the first order of business for law enforcement would have been to take to the streets and restore order, then close the borders and start looking for answers. To do that, searching suspicious ships in the harbor would be one of the steps on the list. There were probably a dozen containment scenarios in progress across the country, including interrogating foreigners. All of it would aid in his plan to slip into the chaos and disappear for a while. Can you climb? The first cop asked him. Hansen nodded. I'm pretty sore, but I think I can make it. The lead officer helped him onto the first step of the metal staircase. The taller cop stood to the right and used his flashlight to illuminate the steps ahead. The other man climbed the steps behind Hansen, keeping his hand on Hansen's back. Chapter 30 Simon switched places with Slayer, letting the young stud take hold of the two rails of the pull behind Travoy after they'd crossed Big Bug Creek, using a rickety old bridge they'd found a quarter mile upstream. Simon was careful to make sure the triangle-shaped structure didn't tip during the exchange, otherwise the unconscious body of Wyatt would fall from the canvas. Wicks was already beside herself, and the last thing Simon wanted was to toss fuel on her emotional fire by adding to her brother's injuries. Careful, she snapped with her hands under Slayer's while the handoff was made. Relax, I got it, Slayer said after nudging her out of the way. His backside was in position, the same position where a horse would be, with the grab poles on either side of his waist. His back was facing Wyatt's head. In front of them was a stand of thick forest and brush, much denser than what they'd just traversed on Wyatt's side of the creek. They were now on Amish land, heading deeper into uncharted territory, where the rules of a godly life reigned without exception. Simon had never met a member of the Amish before and was looking forward to it. Their simple lifestyle and old-world teachings had a certain charm and grace, something he relished right about now. Actually, it was something the entire world should learn and study, now that power and machinery was useless, probably across the planet. Everyone would be forced to turn old school. Just then, a phrase popped into his head. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Simon, can you move that log up there? I don't think I can get past it, Slayer said, snapping Simon out of his mental retreat. Sure, hang on, he answered, quickening his pace to clear the deadfall from the path. He bent over, lifted, and drug the soggy tree to the right, then waited for Slayer to catch up. I'll walk ahead and keep the path clear. Good idea. I'd like to maintain an even pace so I don't have to keep starting and stopping. This thing is heavy. Wicks, you stay behind and keep an eye on your brother. Let me know if he wakes up, Simon said. Already on it, Red, she said, walking alongside the inclined Travoy, keeping her left hand on Wyatt's shoulder as his head and body moved in concert with every bump in terrain. How's he doing? Simon asked her. About the same, but we really need to pick up the pace. He's still losing blood. I'm trying, Wix, Slayer grunted, but this ain't exactly the expressway. These poles keep sinking in mud. I still think this would have worked better with wheels. They worked their way around a small lake, then past a stand of moss-covered trees with a heavy blanket of red leaves smothering the ground. Everything around them carried a mist of decay and a fungus, filling Simon's nose with the scent of both. You have any idea where we are? Slayer asked Simon. No but we should be getting close. What if we've already cruised past their farm? Simon stopped walking a moment later, then held up a closed fist. Ah, uh, I don't think we need to worry about that. Why? Before Simon could answer, leaves cracked and branches snapped. The sounds were coming at him from a myriad of directions. The dense brush parted and out stepped at least a dozen men wearing mostly black attire. They closed in a few more steps, stopping about 30 feet away to form a circle around Simon and his friends. Some of them had beards, while others didn't, but all of them wore long coats, probably wool, with white dress shirts underneath. 
their distinctive, wide-brimmed black hats, suspenders, and numb faces told him who they were. The Amish. However, their appearance wasn't what he was focused on at the moment. It was their hands. Four of them held pitchforks, while the rest carried other kinds of hand tools. Axe, sling blade, reaping hook, hay knife. Slayer whispered to Simon, I thought they didn't believe in violence. Simon held up a flat palm to keep Slayer quiet, then turned his focus to the men ahead, each with deadpan eyes burning a hole into his. He waited for one of them to speak, but none of them did, each standing erect and motionless. Simon studied their eyes, but couldn't get a read on them. It was as if they were living statues, taking in oxygen but failing to show a glint of emotion. The silent confrontation reminded him of an eerie scene from some low-budget horror flick where the good guys suddenly find themselves surrounded by a pack of silent, flesh-eating hill people. All that was missing was the theatrical, heart-pounding background music to set the mood. But of course, he knew who these people were. The Fishers. And they were no flesh-eaters. Simon moved forward with his hands raised, figuring the religious isolationists needed assurance. He stopped after a beam of sunlight passed over his body and landed behind him. There were four such beams in his vicinity, each piercing the thick canopy of treetops like a spotlight from above. He took a deep breath and let it out, wanting his words to sound calm and reassuring. We mean you no harm. We're only here because we have an injured man and need your help. A slender older man stepped forward, pushing through two of the younger men on the right. His gray beard was the longest of the group and his wrinkles more prominent. He carried a book with a gold cross embossed on its cover and was holding it flat against his chest with both hands. Outsiders are forbidden here. Turn around and go back the way you came, the old Amish man said. I'm sorry, but we can't do that. Our friend is losing a lot of blood and won't survive much longer. I understand you have a doctor who might be able to help. Please, you must leave. There is nothing for you here, the man said, never moving his book from his chest. Wicks raced forward, crunching leaves with heavy feet. She stopped next to Simon. Hey, you people owe my brother. None of the Amish answered. Wicks continued, this time throwing up her arms. Come on, you can't just let him die. Doesn't your religion require you to help all those who need it? Again, nobody answered. Jesus Christ, what kind of people are you? Wicks snapped at the fishers. The old man's lips finally moved, looking as though he was about to respond. Then he closed them, turning his head to the side when a hand landed on his shoulder. A round, middle-aged woman appeared from the brush, taking her hand from the man as she passed. She was wearing all black, with her head covered in a bonnet that looked to be tied under the chin with cloth straps. Her dress was full length and plain, stopping just short of her ankles. It was laced together from her bosom to her neck, looking uncomfortable and restrictive. I'm Sister Hannah, the woman said in a soft voice, her eyes dark as coal. She pointed to the right. This is Brother Joshua. We are saddened by what has happened in your world, but it doesn't concern us. Here, no one raises a hand against another, ever. Strangers only bring sin and violence, and we cannot allow that on our land. Wicks went to say something, but Simon stopped her by grabbing the crux of her elbow. She swung her head at him, allowing him to shoot her a firm look. Let me handle this he said in a low voice, nodding at her gently. She hesitated, then flared her eyes and exhaled. Her shoulders dropped as she backed away. Simon brought his eyes to Sister Hannah, searching for Amish-like words that would soothe her suspicions and make an impression. The man who is injured is no stranger to you. He is a friend. In the past, he helped you find one of your children after she wandered off. We ask that you return the kindness by showing him compassion in this hour of need. Let me assure you, no one here intends to bring violence to your land. We come unarmed with honest hearts. Sister Hannah hesitated for a three count, then turned her back to Simon and began to chat quietly with Brother Joshua. 
For the next minute or so, Simon watched the conversation from afar, as did Wicks, who stood next to him with eyes focused ahead. Hannah finished her conversation, spun around, and walked a few steps closer. She climbed onto a tree stump, then brought her hands up like a Sunday preacher preparing to address the congregation. Her head swung from right to left, making eye contact with several of her brethren. It has been decided. We welcome these outsiders and invite them to come pray with us while the healer tends to their injured man, she said in a voice louder than before. Thank you, Sister Hannah, Simon said, giving her a slight bow. The men in the forest turned and walked away. Hannah extended an open palm to Simon. Please follow us, but we ask that you stay on the path. Simon put his hands on Wick's shoulder. She swung her head at him, showing a face that had lost all of its tension. She seemed content with the outcome. Simon took his hand away, letting his gaze linger for a moment before he spoke. Go help Slayer, but stay behind me and keep your eyes peeled. I'll take point. Is something wrong? She asked in a whisper. He turned his head and checked the woods where some of the Amish men had been standing before they walked away. He hesitated, then brought his eyes back to Wicks. Probably not, but I need both of you to stay alert. Chapter 31 Diesel, can you hand me a tube of the ointment over there? Cat said, pointing to a work table in the livestock barn at Pandora. Now that the red rain had stopped, Cat needed to get caught up on her chores. First up was some triage for one of the male goats, the billy had tangled with an angry cow, taking a few stomps to the head, which led to a bloody three-inch gash across his forehead. Diesel had agreed to help her, but she wished one of the girls had been available. Even G would have been a better choice than Diesel. The thick-fingered kid tried hard, but was a little too hesitant around the animals. They could sense fear and use it against people to impose their will, usually ending with a wicked chomp of angry teeth. She'd asked the others first, but Dixie and Jazz were busy in the main house peeling potatoes for dinner, and G had work to do in the basement, tinkering like usual. This one? Diesel asked, grabbing the center tube of the three. Yep, that's it. He brought it over and gave it to her. Don't you need to sew it up first? No, first we clean and disinfect the wound, then we close. Otherwise, we'll just seal the bacteria inside she said, removing the cap and squeezing an inch-long line of yellow ointment onto her finger. Grab his head and make sure he doesn't snap at me. He's a lot stronger than you think, so make sure you get a firm grip, because he'll fight you. Diesel did as she asked, wrapping his hands around the head of the animal, pinning it to the cushioned blanket on the floor of the barn. Like this? Yeah. Now lean against his rib cage, and whatever you do, don't let go she said, using her free hand to control the goat's hind legs. Diesel brought his chest forward, pressing it against the goat's side. The animal squirmed a bit at first, then settled down. Ready? she asked. Yup, as ready as I'll ever be, he answered, giving her a look of pure fright. She took her finger and rubbed the ointment across the length of the wound. Almost instantly, the billy let loose with one of his legendary baby screams, only this cry was partially muted thanks to Diesel's hands around its snout. The goat started kicking and thrashing about. Diesel held strong, though the expression on his face was priceless. He looked more terrified than the goat, who was reeling from the painful sting of the antiseptic cream. Cat didn't hesitate, finishing the swipe of medicine just as the goat managed to work itself free from Diesel's grip. The portly kid lurched back when the goat showed its teeth, falling flat on his ass. Billy brought his mouth around to take a chomp out of Cat's hand, the same one she was using to restrain the animal's legs, but Cat reacted in time, yanking her fingers out of harm's way. The goat cried out again, then sprang to all fours and took off for the door in a flash. Diesel jumped to his feet and tore after it, yelling at the goat to come back like it spoke English and would obey his commands. She started laughing, watching the pudgy kid chase the lightning-quick goat through the door and disappear to the right. Cat was about to get up and join the chase when she heard a loud whack. A moment later, Diesel flew back into view, just beyond the open door, landing flat on his back. 
She gasped when she noticed his forehead was bleeding and his eyes were closed. A pair of hunting boots stepped into the doorway from the right. She looked up and saw an ugly man with long hair, stained teeth, and a shotgun in his hands. He was wearing camouflage hunting pants and a matching shirt, both with forest patterns and colors. Based on the way he was holding the weapon backwards with his elbows up, she knew he'd rammed the butt of the rifle into Diesel's forehead. She got up to run, but the man turned the shotgun around and aimed it at her with fire in his eyes, cocking the slide. Don't you move there, missy. She stopped her feet and stood upright with her hands in the air. Not an inch, or I'll blow a hole in you the size of Texas. What do you want? She asked, her lips trembling. The man didn't answer. He slid over a few feet to her left, just as more legs appeared in the doorway from the right. The first set belonged to a round black man wearing a military uniform with blood stains on the collar and chest. His hands were behind his back and his face swollen and bruised. A white handkerchief with red blotches on it was wrapped around his head, pressing into his mouth. As the bound man moved farther into view, Cat saw a rifle pressed against the back of his neck and a tattooed hand holding onto his shoulder. Someone was guiding the man forward, showing more and more of an arm tattoo that extended up from the hand. The artwork showed a skeleton's head, and it was sitting on a body that had been wrapped loosely in a red and blue Confederate flag. A second later, she watched the rest of the third stranger step into the doorway. He was another long-haired hillbilly type, wearing hunting garb, a man whose face looked a lot like the one carrying the shotgun. A brother, maybe? She couldn't be sure. All ugly hairballs looked alike to her. His bolt-action rifle had a scope on it. She assumed it was a hunting rifle. Five more intruders moved into view behind the first three, standing with their backs to the door about ten feet beyond the barn. She assumed they were standing guard, keeping an eye on the rest of Pandora. Where to others? The shotgun man asked. She figured he was the leader. She gulped, forcing a lump of saliva down her throat. Her friends were still inside, and she didn't want these men to know. It's just the two of us. That's it. And, of course, the animals. Bullshit! He snapped as his face burned red. Tallywicky! Where is the bitch? I don't know what you're talking about. The man dipped the end of his shotgun, pointing the barrel at Diesel's chest. Tell me now, or this tub of shit gonna get a chest full of lead? She froze, not sure what to do. The leader's eyes flared wide and his jaw extended. He raised his arms, looking like he was going to fire. Okay, okay, don't shoot, please. I'll tell you what you want to know. Where is she? She's not here. Don't test me, bitch. I won't ask again. I'm telling you the truth. Yes, I do know her, but she's not here. I swear to God. She left earlier to go visit her brother. That's all I know. Please, don't hurt us. The leader hesitated. Then the tension in his arms eased, and he lowered the shotgun a few inches. He turned his head away and called out to the group of men standing watch outside. Snake, come here. A man turned and ran inside with a rifle that looked military. She didn't know what kind, but she did recognize his colorful tattoos. His face, neck, and hands were covered in snakes, each with their fangs exposed. He craned his neck up to look at the taller leader, but didn't speak. The leader pointed at Cat. Gag the redhead. Then let's go see who be inside the house. Gag her with what, Sean? Snake asked in a deep, uneven voice that sounded like he was talking with a mouthful of marbles. Sean focused his eyes at Cat, then aimed them at her chest, lingering before he spoke. That there shirt. By the look of her, she won't mind. I want to see what she got underneath. Snake turned his eyes at her and let out a twisted half-smile. It grew on the side of his lips like cancer sending a nauseous feeling to her stomach. She saw mostly gums, as the man was missing all but three of his teeth, two up and one down, like a demented jack-o'-lantern. 
cat couldn't stop her lungs from pumping twice as hard as before, making her breath short and head dizzy. She wanted to run, but she knew she'd never make it. Not with all those men and their weapons, each looking like they'd gun her down in an instant. Screaming for help wouldn't work either. Not with the barn doors facing away from the main house, where the rest of her friends were busy inside. They'd never hear her. Not from this distance, and not at this angle. Even if they could, they'd be outnumbered and outgunned the moment they arrived, and she couldn't take the risk. Then there was Diesel, who was lying at their feet. He was bloody and unconscious, completely at their mercy. If she called out for help, ran away, or attacked these men, they'd surely kill him first, then her, then do the same to her friends inside the house. The black guy in the uniform turned his head and looked at her. Whoever he was, his eyes said it all. Surrender, or they'll kill you. She decided to hold still and do exactly what the long-haired men wanted. It was her only choice. Cat kept her arms up and her feet still as Snake came at her. Her mouth was pumping air at a furious, shallow pace, adding to her dizziness. She locked eyes with the tattooed creeper, shaking her head rapidly at him, hoping he'd change his mind. Snake continued his advance until he was standing only a few inches from her. She could feel the warm stench of his breath as it washed over her face and chilled her bones. He pulled a six-inch knife and spoke in a gravelly voice, the syllables muffled and hard to understand. Don't you move. I hate for a little honey like you to get hurt. Just then, the heavy-set black man in the uniform lunged at the leader standing in the doorway, grunting something through the gag in his mouth. His shoulder slammed into Sean's chest, sending both of them into the left side of the doorframe. They hit hard, then dropped to the ground, with the fat man landing on top. The black man's hands were still tied behind his back, but he managed to roll off Sean. He worked his legs under his frame, then went to get up, but the man with the skeleton tattoo rammed the butt of his rifle into the back of his head, sending him back to the ground with a thud. Cat bit her lower lip, realizing the military man wasn't getting up. It was just her against these armed men. Snake laughed and tugged at her shirt, taking her attention from the man on the ground. His fingers grabbed the bottom of the material pulling it away from the skin. She closed her eyes as his knife hand slipped underneath, his knuckles grazing the center of her belly. The cold pressure inched its way up toward her breasts, moving in concert with a rising tug on the cotton. She fought the urge to scream as the room started to spin. Tears fell as the emotions inside swirled into a jumbled mess, making her hands shake and her knees weak. Somehow, she kept her body upright and mostly still while Snake continued his work. Thread by thread, she could feel her shirt being cut by the man's knife, sliced down the middle to expose her chest to the hungry eyes of the men watching. She was wearing a bra and only 17 years old, but she knew her ample 34C bosom would certainly draw their attention once fully exposed. Cat said a silent prayer for God to help her as Snake finished cutting her shirt in half. A rush of cold air landed against her skin, sending the terror within her to an even higher level. All she could do was stand there and cry, waiting for whatever the filthy mouth breathers would do next. Chapter 32 Wicks stood with her back against a wall in the Fisher's residence, with her hand covering her mouth, listening to Wyatt scream. Her brother was awake at least, but breathing heavily and leaning over sideways in the bed with his shirt off. The elderly Amish healer, whose eyes were as black as coal, had just poured some kind of special elixir into the entry wound along Wyatt's bloody side, sending him into agony. The unnamed country doctor took a wad of cotton from the tray next to the bed and twisted it into a long, thin tube and poured more of the special antiseptic along its length. He made eye contact with Wyatt and held it in front of the wound 
until her brother nodded. Wicks could see sweat pooling on the doctor's brow as the old man gently pushed the swab into the bullet hole with the tip of his finger. Wyatt arched his back and screamed again, this time louder than before. Wicks put her hands on her stomach, covering the knot growing and twisting inside. It was hard to watch her brother in such distress, but she couldn't tear her eyes away. She needed to keep close watch on everything, just in case the witch doctor went off the rails with some kind of Amish voodoo. The healer pulled his wrinkled finger from the wound and grabbed an implement from the tray next to the bed. It looked like a homemade ice pick. He held it up, looking at Wyatt and waiting in silence. Wyatt's painful moan subsided a few seconds later, sweat pouring from his head and dripping down the side of his face. He took three deep breaths, then brought his eyes to the doctor's. He gave the healer a single head nod, then sucked in a chest full of air and held it. A moment later, the doc used the instrument in his hand to push the swab deeper into the track of the bullet. Wicks expected her brother to let out another shriek, but he didn't. He only exhaled, winced, and sucked in his lower lip. Then his mouth began to move air in and out in a deliberate, rapid fashion. Over and over he gasped for air with eyes wide, somehow keeping all the pain and everything else he was feeling inside. The healer moved his free hand around to Wyatt's back, then grabbed hold of the cotton as it made its way through the damage path and out the exit hole. The doc pulled at it, sending more pain into Wyatt's eyes, but her brother only grunted and moaned as the doctor finished the clean-out process. As soon as the cotton was free from his body, Wyatt flung his head back and let his shoulder blades crash into the white sheet covering the bed. His chest was heaving and his face and hair soaked in sweat. Wicks ran to his side, grabbing his hand and holding it to her heart. The weary eyes of her brother looked up at her. Fuck, that hurt. She had tears in her eyes, as did he, but she didn't have the words to express what she was feeling. She decided to give him a tender look with her eyes, then tuck a lip and nod slowly, hoping to reassure Wyatt that she was there for him. He sent back a thin smile, followed by a long exhale with puckered lips. Wicks recognized the look. Wyatt was happy the doctor was almost done and thankful to still be alive. She knew the excruciating pain was subsiding based on how the tension in his body had eased and his breathing slowed. His eyes never left hers until the healer spoke. Please step back. I need to finish dressing his wound. She did as the bearded man said, letting go of Wyatt's hand. Simon took her by the arm and led her toward the door. He's gonna be okay, Tally, but we need to let the doc finish so your brother can rest. She nodded, following Simon's lead into the next room. The door closed behind them. Blake Anderchuk put his arms behind his head and under the plush pillow, looking at the ceiling of the spacious stateroom on his mega yacht, the Octopus. He heard a knock at the door. I'm busy, he said sharply, lifting his head and looking down across the bed at the door. His usual bonus round with the two girls in bed with him was about to start, and he didn't want to be interrupted. I know you said you didn't want to be bothered, but it's urgent, Blake. We have an unscheduled visitor, a female's voice said. It was Tracy, the new blonde girl who'd just joined his live-aboard crew of former NFL cheerleaders. She was a total fitness freak and a little shy, but had the nicest booty he'd ever seen. It had only been a week since she was hired, so he hadn't tapped it yet, but that day would soon come. Otherwise, he'd toss Tracy back and replace her with one of the hundreds waiting in line to take her place. Hang on, he yelled back, removing two arms from his chest. One of them belonged to his personal assistant, Patricia, who was lying on his right, and the other was Don's, his second favorite, who was to the left. He crawled over Don and made his way off the mattress, flinging the satin covers to the floor. He found his pants and slipped them on, taking a moment to admire the pair of shapely, firm asses staring back at him. Both girls were lying on their stomachs, 
breathing heavily like two properly fucked women should be after a 50-minute session. He was thankful they were into each other too, and not just him. Otherwise, their daily threesomes would get a little boring. And if he were to be completely honest, a little draining since both women were multi-orgasmic. The sheets were always soaked at the end, but he didn't care. That's why he had laundry facilities below deck. When the girls went at it with each other, it gave him a break to catch his breath and re-energize his heart on. Ever since he'd turned 45, his erections and his stamina had started to fade a bit. Old Doc Brown, the drunk who lived in the stateroom at the far end of the boat, had offered him a supply of the little blue pill, but he wanted to put off that level of assistance for as long as he could. So far, Patricia and Don could still get him up and off, so he figured there was no reason to add medication to the mix. Not yet, though he was considering it. He went to the door and opened it. Who the fuck is here? Somebody named Jigsaw in a black speedboat. Jigsaw? He said, wondering what the hell was going on. The ruthless man had never met him on open water like this. Their meets were usually planned far in advance and at some clandestine location, never with others around. Did he say why he was here? No, just that he demanded to speak with you immediately. Who's Jigsaw, boss? Blake nudged the six-foot-tall chick to the side as he slipped past her, not giving her an answer. Then he stopped his feet and turned to her. He pointed at the girls on the bed. Keep them company till I get back. Keep them company? She asked with a look of confusion filling her big, beautiful blue eyes that hovered above a petite, turned-up nose. Yeah, it's time, Tracy. Time to eat some pussy and become a full-fledged member of the crew. She hesitated, looking at the girls and then back at him with her long, exquisite eyelashes blinking rapidly. He nodded, pointing at the bar in the corner of the room. There's some wine and booze if you need it. I'll be back in a few minutes to join you. She turned and went inside the room, untying the string on the back of her bikini top. He watched her toss it aside, then remove her bottoms before climbing into bed with the other girls. Blake took off down the hallway toward the stairs at the far end, running through a few scenarios in his mind. He replayed their last few conversations, thinking through Jigsaw's talking points. Nothing stood out that might explain the need for this unscheduled visit. He was sure he hadn't forgotten to complete any of his assigned tasks. Plus, none of them had gone sideways. That meant something new had come up. It was the only explanation. His feet pounded at the steps, taking him topside. Chapter 33 Dixie huddled next to Cat, trying to keep the girl warm, as the ride in the back of the old truck continued. The Carnegie brothers had removed her shirt and left her in only a bra and pants before they tossed her into the vehicle with the other members of the Pandora crew. There was dirt and scratches on Kat's shoulders and back, plus a bruise on her cheek from God knows what. Her eyes were distant and her face looked numb, either from the brisk air rushing past or from whatever might have happened in the barn before the marauders came into the house looking for wicks. Dre was sitting next to Cat and across from Diesel, his vision focused at his feet while the sway of the truck rocked him from side to side. The normally exuberant kid was eerily silent and still, not moving his eyes or head since he'd been tied down like a dog. The Carnegie brothers had been hauling ass on the country road for about 30 minutes on their way to Jericho, meaning they should be closing in on Wyatt's place. Dixie had never been to his compound, but Wicks had mentioned it was less than an hour's drive from Pandora, at normal speed. She wasn't sure what came next, but prayed Wicks, Simon, Slayer, and the men of Jericho would be ready when this band of criminals rolled up. There was a deep-rooted ache in her bones, and it was spreading like freshly released snake venom. She'd felt the sensation once before. It was six years ago, and only moments before she received the news that her parents were killed in a fiery plane crash. The chilling ache meant something bad was coming, and it would start with her. Dixie was thankful G, G 
Jazz and the prisoner named Austin hadn't been nabbed too. Three less people to worry about. With Cat, Dre, and Diesel sitting with her, she had her hands full already. She figured the others must have heard the commotion upstairs and slipped away by using the hidden escape tunnel. There weren't any gunshots before the men tossed her into the truck and sped off, so she didn't think they'd been taken out in the pasture and shot to death. Diesel was sitting across from her, with his shoulders hunched and eyes glazed over, probably suffering from a concussion. The gash in his forehead had finally stopped bleeding, but the skin was hanging open. He needed stitches and a few days in bed to rest. If they hadn't all been gagged and tied together at the feet, she might have been able to convince her friends to jump from the speeding truck to get away. However, each had their hands bound behind their backs and lashed to the nearest tie-down, so none of that was going to be an option. She made eye contact with the heavy-set black man sitting next to Dre on the other side of the truck. He, too, was gagged and tied to the truck bed. His face carried bruises, and there were several bloodstains on his chin and white shirt, another victim of the men who had announced they were the Carnegie brothers. Dixie didn't know who the uniformed man was, but his face told her he was deep in thought, or perhaps he was just scared shitless and distant. She couldn't tell which. The vehicle swerved to the left, sending everyone in the back of the truck leaning hard to one side as the convoy tore down a dirt road. She sat back up, then had to brace herself when the truck came to a full stop ten seconds later. Sean Carnegie flew out of the cab from the passenger side and came around to the bed, holding his shotgun high and directly at Dixie's face. She stared at the barrel, only an inch from her right eye. His brother Sebastian slid out from behind the steering wheel, joining the effort. He stood next to Sean, then took a long-handled knife from a sheath on his belt. He held it up for a second, then angled and pressed the glistening tip to her chest. Dixie leaned back and flared her eyes, thinking he was about to drive the blade into her heart. She watched Sebastian turn his head at Sean and wait, like he was seeking approval to kill her. Get busy, Sean said with firmness in his voice. No, 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 she screamed into the gag, hearing her own words garbled beyond recognition. Sebastian laughed, showing his ugly smile, then moved the knife from her chest down to her feet. A second later, he cut the rope to free her from the others. Dixie let out the breath she was holding in her lungs, realizing they weren't going to kill her. At least not yet. She slid her legs back from the brothers, tucking them to one side. Sebastian put his hand on her shoulder and leaned her over, then cut the connecting rope, keeping her tied to the truck bed. If her hands hadn't been bound together, she would have brought a fist around and landed a punch. But she couldn't, so she did the only thing she could. Scoot back a few inches. Sean's hand went behind her back, grabbing one of her wrists with a forceful grip. He yanked hard, spinning her torso around until she was lying on her back, looking up. He moved his hand to her shirt collar and pulled her backwards, sliding across the bed of the truck and past the others, who were now squirming and screaming muffled words into their gags. A second later, the open tailgate passed under her back, then she dropped to the ground hard, sending a thud into her spine. She ignored the pain and looked up, meeting Sean's sadistic smile with her eyes. He brought his hand down and grabbed the front of her shirt, pulling her to her feet. She struggled for a few moments, then stopped when the back of his hand struck her right cheek. The sting was intense, but she never cried out. If she hadn't had the cloth in her mouth, she would have spit in his face right then and there, then leaned forward and taken a bite out of his huge, mangled nose. He grabbed her hair, pulling in close to his lips. Resist me again, bitch? I cut your fucking heart out. Then... I'll do the same to your friends. So what it gonna be? She turned her head and looked away, letting her resistance fade. That's what I figured, Sean said, dragging her around to the front of the truck. He gave Dixie to Sebastian, then hopped up and sat on the hood, facing forward. Sebastian moved his hand from her shoulder and put it on her ass, 
grabbing a cheek with his open palm. He guided her forward, then lifted her off the ground with her butt cupped in his hand. She knew what they wanted her to do, so she climbed up under Sebastian's control. Sean spun her around and positioned her in his lap with her back against his chest. Sean's left hand was now wrapped around her waist, while his right hand held the end of the shotgun barrel to the right side of her head. Drive slow, Sean told his brother. Yeah, I know, Sebastian said, disappearing to her left. The truck listed to one side as she felt him climb into the driver's seat, then shift the transmission into drive. There was a tug at her stomach, then the touch of his lips against her ear. Hold still. Otherwise, you end up as roadkill. And you know what happened to roadkill round here? It end up in a pot for supper. She nodded, feeling his breath on her cheek. His arm inched up, pressing at the skin just below her breasts. Dixie thought about Cat and what they'd probably done to her in the barn. Anger swelled, pushing her blood pressure higher than it already was, fueling her mind with thoughts of retribution. Right then, an idea came to her. She was sitting in Sean's lap with her hands tied behind her back. His attention was focused elsewhere and probably wasn't aware that her fingers were only inches from his crotch. All she needed to do was reach out and grab his balls and then squeeze them with all her strength. Yes, crush the life out of his ball sacks. That's what her heart wanted her to do. Payback for Cat, payback for Diesel, payback for all the other people these assholes had hurt over their pathetic lives. She opened her palms and was about to reach out and latch onto his manhood, but then her logic screamed at her to stop. She did, pulling her hands back and curling them into fists. His pain would only be temporary, and eventually he'd recover. Then he or his brother would kill everyone she knew and loved. In the end, her plan wouldn't accomplish anything and only make matters worse. As much as she wanted to, she couldn't go through with it. She had no choice but to let the thoughts of revenge slip away. The truck inched forward, passing the other vehicles and taking the lead as the convoy approached what she assumed was Wyatt's compound and its main house. Sebastian drove the truck slowly past the damaged front gate, then pulled around and parked facing forward in front of the farmhouse. The other trucks inched forward, taking positions on both sides of the vehicle she was sitting on. The home had significant damage across the front, looking like someone had detonated a bomb on the porch. The roof line had caved in and exposed some of the interior. Some of the debris had scorch marks, and so did one of the remaining walls. To the right, and farther back on the property, she noticed two more structures. Barns, she assumed. The first one must have been burned to the ground, leaving only some of its foundation behind, with charred wood along its base. The other barn looked like another bomb had gone off, part of it collapsing in on itself. A lengthy antenna pole was lying nearby, probably for Wyatt's ham radio station. Dixie felt a push from behind, sending her ass across the hood and down past the grill. Her feet hit the ground, with Sean landing behind her. He was still holding the barrel of the shotgun to her head, but his left arm had moved up from her waist. It was now wrapped tight around her chest, pressing down on her breasts. The two of them walked three steps closer to the building, then stopped. Sebastian joined them a few seconds later, standing to the side with his rifle pointed at the front of the house. Dixie could hear more gear rattling and the clatter of movement behind her. She figured some of the other men had joined the skirmish line. Sean pressed the shotgun into her temple, making her head lean to the left. Then he took in a deep breath, pressing his chest against her back. Come out, Wyatt, and bring that slut of a sister with you. Otherwise, I spray this bitch's brains all over your property. Dixie's panic turned into a flood as she waited for signs of movement inside the house. Her insides felt like melted cheese and her head was spinning. It was all too much to process, not knowing if the very next moment might be her last. Her eyes darted around the homestead, looking for clues, but none were to be found. 
she moved her gaze to the shotgun trained at her head. Right then, time seemed to slow down, the seconds ticking by in long, extended beats. Every one of her senses was on fire while she waited and listened for the click of a trigger, a single, nearly inaudible click that would deliver the end of all she was and all she would ever be. She closed her eyes, wishing she could simply switch off her awareness and let it happen. She didn't want to be tuned in when death came at her, fearing the shock of a painful, tragic demise would haunt her soul for all of eternity. Sean spoke again, louder this time, snapping her eyes open. Wyatt, you asshole. Don't you test me, boy. Come out now or I pull the trigger. Got more in the truck and I waste them all. Thirty agonizing seconds went by, and no answer came. Neither did any sign of movement from inside the compound. Look like he gonna let you die, girl, Sean said to Dixie. He let go of her, then kicked her in the ass, sending her stumbling forward. Run, bitch. What you doing, Sean? Sebastian asked. Target practice, he answered in a swift, decisive voice. She hesitated, thinking about making a break for it just as her captor suggested. Every fiber of her being wanted her to take off running, knowing it was her one and only chance to get away. It might work if she ran in a zigzag pattern, but she couldn't move her legs. She tried again to convince them to run, but they wouldn't budge. It felt like they were anchored in the mud. Before she could try again... A tsunami of thoughts and feelings poured into her, taking her down a new line of thinking. Running away was precisely what the asshole wanted. Somehow, she knew he needed a reason to gun down an innocent girl. Then, a woman's voice spoke up from inside the darkest recess of her mind. She'd never heard the tiny voice before, but she knew it was right, and she needed to listen to it. Stand your ground. Don't give him the satisfaction. She spun in the mud and dropped to her knees, looking up at him. Her tears stopped, and so did the trembling, as a new kind of strength rose from within. It was something she didn't know she possessed, but it brought a sense of order and peace to an otherwise impossible moment in her life. Sean held the shotgun up and aimed at her way. His hands started shaking, then his face turned a deep red color as fire grew in his eyes. The standoff continued for another few seconds. Then he craned his neck and let out a long commando scream that made her bones quake. When his lungs emptied and his voice ran weak, he brought his eyes back to her and put the shotgun against his shoulder. His face went blank, and she knew right then he was going to pull the trigger. She stiffened her back and held out her chest, never taking her eyes from him. Death was coming for her, but she was determined to meet it head on. Fuck you, asshole, she said into her gag. She knew he couldn't understand her words, but she wanted him to hear them anyway. Before Sean could pull the trigger, Sebastian stepped in front of him, blocking his view of Dixie. Get out of my way, brother, Sean yelled. No, Sean, we not do this. Move, now. Sebastian didn't flinch. Put the gun down. Why the fuck would I do that? Because this ain't the right move. I be in charge, not you. Now move your ass, boy. How do you know Wyatt and his sister even be here? Sean didn't answer. Look around. This place already attacked. Whoever they were might have killed Wyatt and Tally or taken them hostage when they left. We really don't know for sure. If they not here, then killing this bitch won't change a thing. What if we need her later? There was a long silence. Then Sean's face appeared to Dixie when he moved out and around his brother. His shotgun was no longer in a firing position, its barrel aimed at the ground. Spread out. Search the place, Sean said, taking his eyes from Dixie. Chapter 34 Wicks walked side by side with Simon 
as they followed Sister Hannah on a dirt path that cut through the middle of the sprawling grassy areas on the Amish property. Slayer was a few yards behind her and had been holding up the rear ever since they'd left Wyatt in the hands of the healer. The clean-out and dressing of her brother's gunshot wound seemed to go well, and now he was asleep. There were a number of two-story buildings ahead of them, all of which were on the far side of three sections of split-rail fencing that seemed to go on for miles, disappearing beyond the rolling hills and tree stands of the property. The buildings were all painted the same, a basic tan color with a dark brown trim. Their steep, twin-peaked rooflines were covered in what she assumed were wooden shake shingles, though everything had a red hue to it, including the white fencing and green countryside. There was also a brick chimney rising above the center of each structure, puffing a long trail of smoke into the crisp country air. Some of the structures were obviously residences, with their white window curtains, screen doors, and spacious front porches sitting on a raised deck. Each porch had the same amount and style of outdoor furniture a pair of high-back rocking chairs, a three-person wooden bench, and a plain rectangular coffee table. About half of the furniture was occupied with elderly members of the Fisher clan, some smoking pipes and chatting with one another, while others stared ahead in silence, watching the buzz of activity. All of the homes appeared to have been built to face the interior of the property, forming a circle around a central point. Her eyes took a quick survey, realizing the gap in the fencing ahead was the central point of the homestead, an efficient hub-and-spoke design. She imagined what it would be like after a long, hard day's work, all of the residents sitting on their porches at sundown, sipping lemonade and smoking their pipes. All the while, each Amish was staring across the courtyard at one another in silence, like some demented gawker fest. Stacks of firewood sat in front of each home, clearly the source of heat in the winter. Nearby, she watched young, beardless Amish males delivering powerful strikes with an axe to split the next log on a chopping stump. Then, after the mall found its mark, one of the children would scramble to gather the two halves and various splinters, carrying them swiftly to the pile. Then the process would repeat starting with the axe-wielder adjusting his trousers and suspenders before placing another log on the stump. She glanced at two females standing near a central water pump that looked to be made of cast iron. It was painted black and rose up from the ground about three feet. One of the women was busy hand-cranking its gooseneck handle, while the other held a bucket under the pump's turned-down spout. Wicks could feel the eyes of many weighing on her chest as they continued their trek to the central dining hall for a meal with the elders. Some of the gazes belonged to women who were tending a clothesline, hanging the day's wash to dry. Others were curious children who'd stopped playing to watch the outsiders. Now I know what monkeys feel like at the zoo, she whispered to Slayer, who was now walking next to her. Slayer laughed. Yeah, no doubt. Creepy to say the least. Simon had moved two steps ahead and was following Sister Hannah as she slipped through the gap in the fencing, then turned right and headed along a different path that took them across an adjoining grassy area. The group passed an herb garden, two washboards, a pull-behind cargo wagon, and a pen of horses, then the edge of a massive cornfield. A few minutes later, they arrived at their destination. Hannah went up the front steps and stepped through the front entrance. So did the Pandora crew. Dixie was on her knees, with Sean's shotgun aimed at the back of her head, when Sebastian returned to the front of Wyatt's farmhouse. Following behind Sebastian were four other men carrying weapons and boxes. One was a man called Snake, but she didn't know the names of the rest because they hadn't said much since the kidnapping began back at Pandora. Like a figure, nobody here, Sebastian told Sean as the other men walked past and put the guns and other items into the back of one of the international trucks. Did you search everywhere? Sean asked his brother. You damn right I did. Kitchen, bedrooms, basement, closets, everywhere. Even what's left of that there barn. I see you found some guns. Oh yeah, there be ammo too. Must have been in a hurry, cause who leaves this stuff behind? 
Some of it looked brand new. Still in their boxes. Them UPS stickers everywhere. Must have been a delivery here too, Sean said. Except they got a lot better shit than we did. Snake even found one of them Russian AA-12 shotguns. Fully auto. Any ammo? Sebastian nodded. Found six of them 32-round drums already loaded. I know how much you like scatter guns. I'm guessing you're gonna want it. Hell yeah. I'll tell Snake. He ain't gonna care. There'll be lots of shit to choose from. Which way did they go? Tracks head west. Looks like they ran over the back fence on the way out. It'd be possible whoever attacked this place went after them. How long ago this be? Hard to tell for sure after all the rain. Tracks be washed out, all run together like. Must have been a while ago, before that rain stopped. Yup, but we did find us some blood, lots of it, and it ain't been washed away, so it ain't near as old. Where? Basement and kitchen. It leads to a barn. No bodies? Nah, but they buried some. There'd be signs of digging out back, three of them holes. Want me to dig them up and see if they'd be Wyatt or his sister? Sean's eyes narrowed before he nodded. Let Snake and the other boys do it. I need you to watch the bitch while I check all the blood. You said it went to the barn? Sean asked, pointing. There'd be a pool inside, next to a bloody towel. Someone got treatment then, huh? Sebastian nodded, raising his gun at Dixie. Put her in the truck, Sean said, walking away. Chapter 35 Slayer waited in silence, near the middle of a long, dual pedestal table in the dining hall of the Amish homestead. Wicks was rubbing elbows with him on the left, while Simon stood motionless directly across. Slayer brushed the tips of his fingers across the smooth, polished surface as he admired the symmetry of the china and silverware on the table. Each of the fifteen place settings included a neatly folded cloth napkin on the right and an empty water glass waiting at eleven o'clock high. Down the middle of the table was an alternating series of quart-sized glass pitchers filled with water, and four gas-powered lanterns, all burning brightly. The combination of the darkened room and the flickering light made him feel like he'd stepped back in time to the medieval days of ancient Europe. Brother Joshua and nine other Amish men were also standing in silence around the table, each in front of a pulled-out high-back chair. This was the first time Slayer had seen any of them without their black hats and dress coats on, making them look a lot less intimidating. The youngest-looking of the group, maybe 40 years old, was standing next to him and fidgeting with his suspenders. Then his hands moved to the tuck of his dress shirt, then his hair, and finally his zipper. At least the man had put his cane against the wall, leaning it carefully before he stood in front of his chair. Otherwise, Slayer figured he would have been smashed in the shin by now. Slayer peered to his left taking a few moments to observe the apron-wearing women working around another table in the adjoining kitchen. One was slicing meat from a good-sized turkey, while the others were tending to other preparation duties. A few seconds later, Sister Hannah appeared, wheeling in the senior elder of the household, Isaac Fisher. The balding, gray-haired man looked to be in his eighties, with hanging, weathered skin on a face covered in brown, irregular-shaped spots. His chin was squared off across the bottom and carried a raised scar that ran from right to left. The old man's seasoned eyes found Slayer's, lingering a bit as Hannah rolled him forward in the wheelchair. She slid Isaac into place at the head of the table, then stood to his right, taking position in front of the lone, empty chair. Please sit, she told the group. The Fisher men sat in unison, leaving the Pandora crew standing for a few moments until Wicks took a seat. Simon followed a second later, and so did Slayer. Hannah remained standing as she addressed those in attendance. Let us pray to God. The Amish men closed their eyes and lowered their heads, dipping their beards into their chests. Hannah and old man Fisher closed their eyes as well, tilting their heads down. 
Wicks followed suit, as did Simon, but Slayer kept his open. He didn't like the idea of sitting blind in a room full of strangers. Someone needed to keep an eye on things. About thirty seconds of silence ticked by before Hannah spoke again. We who are separate give thanks for our allotted time on this earth. Give us strength to bring forth the bounty that you have so generously provided. The Amish men responded in unison. Amen. She continued. We pray for our day of redemption, the moment of release. Amen. We pray for those troubled souls who live in the darkness beyond our stead. May they someday find the path to righteousness and eternally prosper through you with a meek and merciful heart. Amen. Let us eat, she said, opening her eyes. The men did the same. Then the women brought the food out and put it on the table, all within arm's length of Hannah. She sat down and dished up a plate of food in front of Isaac, one slice of turkey, a smattering of green beans, and a single homemade roll. When she was done preparing his plate and then hers, she passed the meat tray to the man on her right. An assembly line process started, whereby each person took turns taking some food and then passing it to the right. Eventually, the meat, veggies, and rolls found their way to Slayer. He dished up a heaping plate of grub and dug in to fill his starving belly, occasionally glancing over at Hannah to watch her methodically spoon-feed the patriarch of the settlement. First, she'd deliver a bite, then wait for Isaac to slowly chew with his mouth open while drool ran down his chin. She'd finish the round with a quick wipe of the cloth napkin, then start the process over. Slayer held back a laugh. It was like watching a retarded zombie gum his food. Sean Carnegie kicked at a bloody towel in Wyatt's barn, checking over the scene while Sebastian and his guys were digging up the bodies outside. The blonde girl from Pandora was back in the truck and tied down with the others. Next to the towel was a pool of blood next to some used bandages. He bent down and checked the blood with his fingers. It had soaked into the dirt about half an inch, but wasn't completely dry. Someone was treated here all right, no doubt about it. Whether it was one person or more, he couldn't be sure. There were lots of footprints around, but Sebastian and his men were just in here checking the place, so he didn't know which prints were new and which were old. He stood and continued to look around, seeing two piles of wood shavings and several pieces of cut rope on the ground. There were two drag marks sitting heavy in the dirt, about four feet apart, never changing their spacing the entire way from the towel to the door. To the right was a piece of tarp. It had been cut, all precise-like. The hole in it showed a triangle. He figured someone cut it and used it on a contraption they built, probably a pull behind to carry something heavy. Something heavy enough to make deep grooves in the dirt, like he'd done many times to haul elk meat from the forest after a kill. He figured the sled was used to carry a person based on all the blood. A live person, since nobody carried away a dead body when there were fresh graves out back. That meant at least two people survived, the one injured and the one who built the cargo sled. Sean wondered if it was Wyatt and his sister, but she was too small and not heavy enough to make the heavy drags, so Wyatt must have been the one injured, and she was carrying him away. He followed the trail outside. The grooves looked the same outside as in, so the rain didn't wash them out not like the tire tracks to the fence, so the pull behind came after. Maybe Wyatt and the bitch stayed behind after the others left in the trucks. Makes sense, he thought. Wyatt was their leader and might have wanted to make sure his men were okay. Or his men chickened out and left them behind. He stood next to Sebastian as the final grave was uncovered by the shovels working the hole. Sebastian dropped inside and bent down to uncover the body's face with his hand, wiping the last of the dirt away. This ain't Wyatt, he said, looking up at Sean. What about the other two? Sean asked, pointing. Already checked them. Not them either. What do we do now? His brother asked. We followed them tracks, he answered, 
thinking they couldn't be too far ahead. She wasn't strong enough to go fast, not when hauling her brother like that. Sean followed the trail out front and stopped where they turned right and headed across the countryside. He turned to Sebastian, who was standing with the rest of the men. They stayed off the road. Smart. Where the fuck they going? Sebastian asked. To the Amish next door, I figure. Looking for help. That's what I'd do if I were them. So we walking? Sean looked to the road, thinking through the options. Nah, we take a trucks. Faster that way. Sebastian and his men started to move, but Sean stopped his brother with his right arm. Wait. What's wrong? Sebastian asked, holding his arms out to stop those behind him. Sean swung his eyes around, feeling as though someone was watching them. He squinted and listened, checking both directions along the road, then scanned the tree stand on the horizon to the left. He didn't see any movement or hear any unexpected sounds. The feeling of being watched started to fade, so he let it go and turned his attention to the truck with the hostages tied down in the back. I'm driving this time. You got shotgun, he told his brother, heading for the road. Chapter 36 Sean Carnegie slowed the truck to a full stop along the country road that ran in front of the first Amish farm they came across. It was in the same direction as the tracks leading away from Wyatt's property. He turned to his brother Sebastian, who was holding a pair of binoculars to his eyes and looking out through the rolled-down passenger window. Do you see them? Sean asked. Nah, just a bunch of them religious freaks. What about the cargo sled? Hang on a minute, I'm a-looking, Sebastian said, moving the glasses a bit to the left. There it be, by that building on the far left, just sitting out front. They must be holed up inside. Hop in the back with them hostages and take watch over the cab. If Wyatt or his sister sticks their head out, shoot them. And if they don't, grab the redhead from the back and meet me out front of the truck when we get there. Just her? What about Blackie and the others? I'll have the rest of the boys bring them up. Sebastian smiled but didn't respond. When Tally see that little bitch and her other friends, she come out and her brother too. Then, we kill them all. What about them Amish folk? He said, opening the side door. They just a bunch of chicken shits. Be like a turkey shoot, or dynamite and fish in the river. Either way, we gonna burn it all down. Sebastian put down the binoculars, grabbed his rifle, and got out of the truck. He moved quickly to the rear bumper. Sean watched him stand on it before getting into the bed of the truck. The cab rocked from side to side as Sebastian moved forward, working his way around the hostages to the rear window. Sean decided to get out too and visit the rest of his men in the trucks behind. He needed to tell them what to do when they approached the Amish. Simon brought a glass to his lips and took a sip of the lukewarm water to help wash down the last of the green beans on his plate. They would have tasted better with some butter and a sprinkle of Parmesan cheese, but they were edible. The turkey wasn't bad either, but it was bland and needed seasoning. The rolls were his favorite by far, served hot and fresh from the oven. Overall, he'd tasted worse, but was thankful for the free meal and the hospitality. He took a minute to study Sister Hannah, then the rest of the bearded men around him, lingering on each person as his gaze made its way around the table. A few of them glanced back at him for a moment before resuming their food intake. Simon brought his eyes to Wicks, sitting across from him. She made eye contact, then gave him a perplexed look and a quick shrug. He figured she'd noticed the same thing he did. None of the Amish spoke a single word while eating. The only sounds permeating in the room were the random clinks of silverware against porcelain, plus the busy pattern of chews and swallows. That, and of course, the occasional slurp of water. Simon wiped his chin and tossed the white napkin onto the plate. Slayer did the same, then sat back in the high back chair and let his shoulders slump as he brought his eyes to Simon. He let out a long exhale, looking tired from the day's activity. 
Wicks still had some turkey on her plate, but it wouldn't be long before she was finished, too. She finished a chew, then brought her head up. Should probably go check on Wyatt, she said to Simon in a low whisper, before dipping her head and jamming another forkful of meat into her mouth. A young girl, maybe ten years old, ran into the dining room, stopping only a foot behind old man Isaac and sister Hannah. Her bonnet was tilted to one side, and she was breathing heavily. What is it, child? Hannah asked. More of the English are here. All of the plate clinking and chewing in the room stopped. It fell dead silent in an instant. Sister Hannah looked at Simon and gave him a worried look. How many? Simon asked the girl. All of them, I think, she told him with eyes wide, then turned to Hannah, bobbing on her toes with excitement. They have guns of the hand. Simon shot out of the chair and went to the girl. Show me, now. The girl gave Simon a curious look, but didn't respond, nor did she move. Hannah touched the girl's shoulder, getting her attention. Show him, Rebecca. Yes, Sister Hannah, Rebecca said, promptly turning and running. Simon and Hannah followed, as did Wicks and Slayer. The girl led them past the kitchen and down a connecting hallway before stopping in front of the picture window next to the front door. Rebecca pointed outside. Wicks pushed ahead, as did Simon, taking position in front of the girl. Slayer crowded in next, but Hannah remained behind. Simon put his hand out to move the lace curtain aside, giving the Pandora crew a clear view of the courtyard and beyond. Four vintage trucks with Confederate flags painted on their door panels were approaching with speed, not slowing for the changes in terrain. They blasted through two sections of the split rail fence, sending the Amish residents scattering in all directions. Many of them took refuge inside the closest home, while a few ran past the nearest building and around back, disappearing from view. Simon had expected the vehicles to be on an intercept course with the dining hall, since it was the largest building and clearly the central point of the property, but they weren't. They looked to be heading straight for the healer's home, moving from left to right across the sprawling courtyard area. Simon took a moment to consider why. Then he saw it. The Travoy. It was sitting in front of the dock's home. The people in the trucks must have been looking for it, and that's why they were targeting its location. It was the only answer that made sense. Just then, more facts lined up in his brain. Those who were approaching must have been to Jericho and noticed the bloodstains in the barn, then followed the tracks in the mud, which in turn led them to this Amish farm. Shit, he'd left a trail. The trucks slowed their approach and eventually came to a full stop about a hundred yards from the dock's home. One of the vehicles was parked about ten feet ahead of the others. Simon assumed it was the lead vehicle carrying whomever was in charge. It had a single person in the cab, the driver, plus someone standing in the back by the rear window wearing hunting clothes and holding a rifle. Both occupants looked to be men based on their size and stature, but their long hair suggested they could have been husky women dressed in hunting garb. The other three trucks carried the same occupancy and configuration, a driver in the cab and a single person armed with a rifle in the back. Then he noticed something different with the lead truck. It had four more people sitting low in the back, but he couldn't see their faces, only the top half of their heads. None of them were looking his way. Simon swung his head around to speak to Wicks, needing her to confirm the identity of the visitors. Carnegie Brothers, he said, his voice preceding his eyes. But she wasn't standing there. He glanced around, but didn't see Wicks. Where'd she go? He asked the group. Slayer shrugged. She was here a second ago. Little Rebecca pointed to the kitchen. That way. Simon bolted toward the kitchen, passing Isaac Fisher in his wheelchair and the rest of the elderly men from the dining room, including the man with the cane. They must have decided to stop eating and come see what was happening at the front of the hall. They'd taken position just inside the archway leading from the hallway, forming a tight-lipped shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder group. They'd arranged themselves from shortest man in front to tallest in the back. Simon looked at the group, but didn't get a reaction from any of them as he ran past. For whatever reason, he got the impression they were watching and judging his actions, like a jury ready to render a verdict. 
When Simon made it to the kitchen, he ran into Wicks, who was holding a meat cleaver and coming his way. What the hell are you doing? He asked her, holding out his arms so she couldn't slip past him. I'm gonna save my brother, she answered, holding the blade up in an attack position. With that? Against those armed men? She nodded with fire in her eyes, but didn't respond. That's a suicide mission, Simon snapped, grabbing her wrist with one hand, then taking the knife from her with the other. I can't let you do that, Wix. She took a swipe at his hands, trying to retrieve the cleaver, but missed. Simon, you have to let me go. The Carnegie brothers are going to kill Wyatt. If you go out there like this, you'll be killed too. But we have to do something. Yes, but not this. From what you've told me, they're probably here for you too, not just your brother. Okay, fine, but we can't just stand here. What are we going to do? Let me go talk with them and see what they want. Maybe I can work out some kind of deal or defuse the situation. That's not going to work. They're animals. We have to kill them before they kill us. I thought you didn't believe in killing, he asked her, remembering the conversation about the exploding bullets back at Pandora. This is different. How? It just is, she said, trying to fight her way around him. We're wasting time. We have to save Wyatt. He stopped her. Not we. Me. I'll go. She shook her head. They'll kill you. Possibly. But while I'm distracting them, I need you to sneak around back with Slayer and get to your brother. Take one of the buggies and get the hell out of here. Get as far away as you can. We'll rendezvous at Pandora. No, Simon. No, she said with a red face. Trust me, I know how to handle men like this. The government spent a lot of money training me over the years. But Simon... No buts, Tally. I need you to just do it. Now go. Go save your brother before it's too late. She nodded, though it wasn't very convincing. She hugged him quickly with tears in her eyes, and the two of them returned to the front room, where Hannah, Rebecca, Slayer, and the elders were waiting. What's the plan? Slayer asked, stepping forward to meet them in the center of the room. You and Wicks, sneak around back and get Wyatt out of here. How? I'm sure Wyatt's in no shape to walk. Simon looked at Hannah. We need to borrow one of your buggies. She blinked at him, but didn't say a word. A man's voice rang out from the grassy area outside, echoing across the property and finding its way inside the window. Wyatt Wicky, this is Sean Carnegie. Me and my brother got some of your friends out here. So come out now and bring that sister of yours. Otherwise, I start killing me some hostages. Hostages? Wick said, hurrying to the window. She looked outside. Oh my god, is that cat? Simon joined her at the window and took a look. Looks like it, he answered, seeing a man standing behind a kneeling cat. She was shirtless, only wearing a bra. The man was pressing the barrel of a very distinctive weapon to the back of her head. A shotgun with a blocky, triangular shape and a large capacity drum magazine. He recognized it a Russian-made Model AA-12. Simon had a chance to shoot the fully automatic shotgun a number of years earlier, during his first assignment under General Rawlings. Next to the man holding Cat were seven more long-haired hillbilly types, each armed with a rifle. Some were assault weapons, but the rest looked to be more traditional hunting rifles with scopes. Four of the seven were holding someone on their knees at gunpoint, just like the first guy. Looks like Diesel, Dre, and Dixie, too, he said, having a better view of everyone than before. He checked, but didn't see G, Jazz, or the new guy, Austin. But I don't see the others. Wicks grabbed him by the arm. Are they dead, Simon? Did they kill my friends? Chances are, the answer was yes, but he couldn't bring himself to say it to Wicks. Let's not assume the worst. They might have gotten away. Who the hell is the black guy? Slayer asked, now looking over Simon's shoulder. Never seen him before in my life, Wicks answered after turning her attention back outside to the Carnegies. His name is General Nate Rawlings, Simon said, recognizing the round, dark-skinned man in uniform, a former colleague, someone he hadn't seen in years. You know him? She asked, never taking her eyes from the window. Yeah, an old friend. Simon said, remembering his days under the general's command. Before he could continue, 
a herd of footsteps came at Simon from the hallway beyond the kitchen. A second later, three young Amish men entered the room carrying farm implements. None of them wore beards or hats, but they were dressed in black pants, white shirts, and suspenders. Each had a look of determination in their eyes. Simon recognized the lads. They were the first of the Amish to reveal themselves in the forest when the Fisher clan surrounded the Pandora crew. No, Caleb, you mustn't, Brother Joshua snapped while standing with the pack of elders. But father, the shortest of the young men said, his blue eyes and hands covered in dirt. His blonde hair hung at shoulder length and was tucked back behind his ears. It is not our way, son, Joshua said with a harsh voice. The evil outside is not our concern. Simon sucked in a frustrated breath, then turned to Hannah. Sister, I know you don't want to get involved, but those men out there will probably kill us all, including you. We have to act now. It's the only option. She still didn't answer. Neither did the group of elders. Simon looked at the Amish leadership, then back at Hannah. Look, if you want to rid this violence from your land, then please help us now. All we need is transportation and a little guidance. If one of you can show us how to get to the back of the healer's home undetected, we'll take it from there. Young Rebecca spoke up. I can show them. No, child, Hannah said, wrapping her hands around the girl and pulling her close. I'll go, Caleb said, holding his chin up, looking at his father. So will I, another of the boys said, raising the pitchfork in his hands. His jet black hair was much shorter than Caleb's, but his face just as pale. He looked to be about the same height as Simon. Me too, said the barrel-chested third boy, his cheeks red and plump. I cannot allow that. Here, no one raises a hand against another, Joshua said. Simon flared his eyebrows and held out his hands. Look, I'm not asking you to raise a hand. We just need a buggy and some directions, nothing else. Sean Carnegie's voice called out again. Wyatt, this is your last chance. You have two minutes to come out or I shoot the bitch. Then I kill the others too. Wicks moved away from the window. Simon, we can't wait any longer. We have to go now. Please, we're running out of time, Simon told Joshua. Brother Joshua started to speak again. Then the feeble man in the wheelchair reached out with his trembling hand and stopped him. Old man Isaac made eye contact with Joshua and gave him a nod, but never said a word. Joshua hesitated, then turned his deadpan gaze to Simon. Caleb will guide you, but only Caleb. Take what you need along the way, but we shall not assist you any further. Thank you, Simon said, nodding at Wicks and Slayer to get moving. They did, tearing down the hallway with the blonde kid, Caleb. Simon studied the thick, black-haired kid with the pitchfork. He thought the young man's heavier build was about the right size. There's one more thing, Simon said to Joshua, pointing at the kid. I'll need his clothes and one of your hats. Then Simon swung his eyes to the man standing in front of the others with the walking stick. Plus your cane. Chapter 37 Sean Carnegie gave the red-headed prisoner to his brother and stepped forward when a tall, burly man came out of the front door of a building on the right. He could only see the lower half of the stranger's face with his hat tilted low, but it clearly wasn't Wyatt Wicky. Wyatt was taller and skinnier, not to mention younger based on the way the beardless man was moving. He was dressed in typical Amish clothes, but coughing and walking slowly, with one hand on a cane. Hold it right there, Sean said, raising the shotgun. The man stopped his approach, balancing his weight on the walking stick. I come with empty hands and an honest heart. What do you want, Amish? I wish to speak with you. May I approach? I have information that you seek. Best you keep it slow, old man. Sebastian leaned over and spoke softly in Sean's ear. Careful, Sean. I don't like the looks of him. Who, that guy? He asked with a smirk on his face, pointing. One religious freak ain't nothing. Look at him. He can barely walk. I don't know. Something ain't right. 
I'll tell you what, bro. Why don't you mind your fucking prisoners and let me handle this old guy? Sean said sharply, letting his voice trail off into a mumble as he continued, talking to himself. Tell me to be careful. Who the fuck do he think he is? Something ain't right, my ass. Slayer held the back door open, waiting for Wicks to join him inside the home of the healer after the Amish teenager Caleb had led them swiftly across the rear of the property and through the edge of the cornfield, using it as cover. Wicks cruised in like General Patton arriving on the scene, then took the lead down the short hallway. Caleb waited outside as Slayer followed Wicks to the bedroom where they'd left Wyatt to rest earlier. Inside the room, they found the healer sitting in a chair next to the foot of the bed. His rail-thin arms were folded across his chest and his head was slumped down at an angle. Slayer stood in front of the drooling old man, hearing a pair of long, slow breaths that ended with a sudden exhale and a chatter of his lips. Man, I think this dude is totally out. Should we wake him? Slayer asked Wicks. Nah, let the old geezer rest. Let's just grab Wyatt and go she answered, bending down to nudge her brother on the arm. Wake up, sleepyhead. Wyatt didn't respond. She tried again, shaking him harder this time. Come on, Wyatt, wake up. It's me, Tally. We really need to get out of here. Slayer looked at the dock. He was still dead asleep. Good thing he was snoring. Otherwise, someone might think he'd croaked in that chair. Wyatt's feet and legs began to stir under the covers. Then his head turned and his groggy eyes opened. He brought them up and smiled, looking at Wicks. Hey, sis. Wicks grabbed Wyatt's hand and spoke in a swift, purposeful voice. The Carnegie brothers are here. We need to go now. Wyatt hesitated for a moment, obviously needing a second for the words to sink in and process. He nodded, then put his elbow under his side for leverage and grunted as Wicks helped him to his feet. Simon kept his hat tilted down and his movements slow, faking an uneven pace on his way to meet with the men out front. The hand-carved wooden cane kept sticking in the soggy grass and throwing him off balance, but he thought the Carnegie brothers were buying his crippled old Amish man act. Otherwise, he figured he'd be full of holes by now, probably from the fully automatic shotgun the leader was carrying. To his right was the healer's house. He hoped Wicks and Slayer had made their way around back and reached Wyatt, who was resting inside. If they hadn't, Simon needed to keep stalling to buy them more time for an escape. He knew his chances of survival against eight armed men were slim, but given his failure to stop Tessa from killing all those innocents on the bus, he needed to step up and take one for the team. The same team that had saved his ass in the alley near the NEC. He coughed a few times to help sell his act, then finished his purposely slow trek to the hillbillies out front. He stopped a short distance away from them to buy himself some extra time to formulate a plan. He kept the brim of his hat still tilted down, not wanting to reveal his face until the proper moment. What you waiting for, old man? The leader asked. On your knees, now. Simon did as the man instructed, dropping to the ground. He let the cane fall forward on purpose, landing next to his right hand. The handle was now farthest away from him, with the bottom of the stick closest to his fingers. He decided not to put his hands up, testing to see if the thugs were wary about a crippled Amish man on his knees. See, Sebastian? Nothing to worry about the leader said with disdain in his voice. Okay, Sean, you're right this time. I'd be right every time, and don't you forget it. Simon slowly tilted his hat up, but just far enough to see the faces of the hostages kneeling in front of the Carnegie brothers and their crew. He couldn't see the eyes of the men holding them at gunpoint, and thus they couldn't see his. He gave the kids a stern expression with a furrowed brow and squinted eyes. He hoped they'd understand his look and not react or try to speak through the gags. It seemed to work, though Dre's eyes did light up more than the others. Simon was worried the high-strung kid might not hold still long enough, giving away the ruse. Cat and Diesel had obviously been hurt, their faces bloody and bruised. 
cat's skin was dirty and covered with scratches. The redhead's cheek was swollen, and her eyes were withdrawn in a world of shame, telling him everything he needed to know. They'd assaulted the young girl. Dixie and Dre looked scared to death, but otherwise, he didn't see any signs of trauma. Simon turned his eyes and found General Rawlings, kneeling in the grass to the far left, directly adjacent to Dre. His old friend had clearly been beaten and wasn't looking at Simon. His attention was on the kids next to him. Simon coughed again, hoping to get Rawlings' attention. Rawlings brought his focus forward, looking at Simon. The general's eyes shot wide for a split second before returning to normal. Simon didn't want to waste a second, sending a covert message with his eyes. He used a special combination of winks that represented Morse code, something he knew his former commander would understand. It was a skill Rawlings had taught him years ago during hostage training. His left eye sent the dashes and his right eye the dots, forming a short sequence of letters. Rawlings confirmed the message by sending back an extended two-eyed blink, holding it for a full second. Simon coughed again, then tilted his head up to reveal his entire face to the leader with the shotgun. The man walked five paces forward, aiming the Russian shotgun at Simon. When he arrived, he put the end of the barrel against Simon's head. Y'all wasted enough of my time, Amish. So tell me now, where the fuck is they? Simon put his plan into motion an instant later. Get down now, he yelled to the kids as he brought his left arm up to knock the shotgun to the side of his head. At the same time, he grabbed the bottom end of the cane with his right hand. The shotgun went off, sending three rounds of automatic fire past his body on the left. Rawlings acted right on cue, tossing his oversized body into Dre next to him. In an instant, Simon brought the cane up, smashing the leading edge of its handle into Sean's throat, cracking his windpipe. The shotgun dropped from the leader's grip as he grabbed for his throat in panic. Simon caught the AA-12 in his left hand before it hit the ground. Rawlings landed on top of Dre and pinned him to the ground. The other members of Pandora had also hit the deck by now, just as Simon hoped they would when he'd screamed at them to get down. Simon flipped the shotgun around, aimed, and pulled the trigger. Boom! The round hit the upper chest of the man who'd been standing behind Rawlings, still trying to react to the sudden burst of activity. Tissue blew apart from his neck and chin, sending his body flopping backwards in a spray of red. As Simon expected, the rest of the amateur thugs flinched when the first cartridge went off, bringing their hands up in front of their faces, giving him a few extra seconds to complete his rescue. Simon pressed and held the automatic's trigger while aiming the shotgun at the next man's chest. The drum magazine loaded a series of shells into the chamber and the hammer set them off in rapid succession. Boom, boom, boom. Each time the gun went off, the buckshot found its way to the next target, hitting each man multiple times in succession from left to right. The discharge continued until all targets were down, except for Sean Carnegie, who was now on his knees, gasping for air. Simon let go of the trigger and stood up, walking over to Carnegie's position, his heart beating at full tilt. He raised the gun and aimed it at the man's head, keeping a safe distance away. Look at me, Carnegie, he said with a tense jaw. Sean brought his head up, locking eyes with Simon as he continued to struggle for air. These are just kids, asshole, Simon said with fury in his voice. What you did to my friends is inexcusable. He pulled the trigger a moment later, and the gun recoiled, blasting the leader in the face. The man's skin blew apart in a shower of blood. Right then, Simon's mind replayed a vision of Tessa's body exploding in the execution chamber. At that exact moment, he knew what the rest of the world felt like after they'd taken their revenge on his wife. He stood over the body of Sean Carnegie, watching the life run out of it as it gurgled, twitched, and ran red with blood. Guilty on all counts, he said in a matter-of-fact voice recalling the verdict from his wife's jury.
Chapter 38 Simon let his insides cool and his temper wane, then decided to go free Rawlings first. He untied the general's hands, needing his help with the others. Good to see you, old friend, Rawlings told him after removing the gag from his mouth. His wrinkled face and weary eyes looked at some of the dead hillbillies lying about. I see you haven't lost a step. Got lucky. They were amateurs. Luck had nothing to do with it. Help me free the kids, Simon said, ignoring the misplaced compliment. Roger that. Simon walked to Dixie. She was shaking a bit, but it didn't take long to remove the rope from her wrists and the gag from her mouth. She went to get up, staring at Cat. Simon held her back, shooting her a look to stay down. He figured it was best if he went to Cat first. Rawlings moved to Dre to free him from the restraints. The second Dre's hands were free, the kid whipped off the gag and started chatting with Dixie, who was next to him. Dre seemed no worse for the wear. Amazing, considering what had just transpired. Simon removed the gag and then the rope from Diesel's hands and took a few seconds to inspect the gash on the kid's forehead. The wound needed stitches and a good cleaning. You okay? He asked Diesel. Diesel nodded, then stood up and ran to Dixie, who was still sitting in the grass. She pulled him down and hugged him, pulling in Dre as well. The three of them huddled together. Simon knelt down beside Cat. The quiet redhead was sitting forward with her knees up and against her body, even though her hands were still bound behind her back. Her eyes were glazed over, staring off into space as Simon freed her. She immediately brought her arms forward and wrapped them around her legs, pulling them closer to her chest. Her eyes remained transfixed on the acres of rolling countryside before her, obviously in shock. Simon slid out of the Amish suspenders, then unbuttoned his cotton shirt and removed it. He put the garment around Kat's shoulders to cover her up and give her some privacy. She let go of her legs and sat up a bit, then pulled the front of the shirt closed around her chest. She fastened the bottom button and began to work her way up, never releasing her million-mile stare. He gently put a hand on her back, not wanting to rush her return to reality. You're safe now, Cat, he said in a slow, soft voice. Take all the time you need. She finished buttoning the shirt, then turned her neck to look at him. Cat held his gaze for a full two seconds, then started to tear up. In a flash, she spun the rest of her body around and flew into him, wrapping her arms around his neck. Then an emotional tsunami came over her as the poor girl began to cry hysterically into his chest. Simon held her tight, feeling the anguish pouring out of her soul. He planned to remain there for as long as it took while she let it all out. His heart wanted him to comfort her with some poignant words, but nothing he came up with sounded right in his head. Not that mere words would have mattered anyway. She'd just gone through her own personal hell and witnessed a string of bloody deaths. Deaths served up at the hands of Simon. He wasn't proud of what he'd done, but he didn't have much of a choice. Sure, he could have let Sean Carnegie live for a few minutes longer with a smashed windpipe, but the man deserved to die for what he'd done to Cat and the rest of the group. Kill or be killed would soon become the new world order as society collapsed under its own weight. It was only a matter of time now that the grid was down and technology was useless. Hansen's red rain had done its job, but Simon figured it was only the tip of what was to come. Simon stood in the grass near the string of bodies he'd left behind as Dixie and Sister Hannah took Cat inside the healer's home for medical attention. Diesel was tagging along with them as well, needing to have the wound across his forehead stitched up. Simon turned to General Rawlings, who was standing with him. That poor girl. No one should ever have to go through that. Rawlings nodded with an angry look on his face, while the two of them stood together in emotional silence, giving the horrific events the minute of respect they deserved. Rawlings cleared his throat, sounding a bit choked up, 
then looked over at the homemade clothes Simon was wearing, stopping on his drab Amish pants. Nice outfit, brother Simon. You look damn good in black. Simon smiled at his old pal, welcoming the change in mood. He didn't want to pass up the chance to take a few jabs at his trusted comrade. I could say the same for you, though it looks like you put on a few. Might be time to see a tailor. Rawlings rubbed his generous belly. Yeah, keeps me warm in the winter. Simon pointed at the gash in the man's head. Should get that looked at. I'm sure there's room in the healer's place for one more. Nah, I'm fine. It takes a lot more than a bump on the head to keep this old dog down. I may be old, but I've still got some fight left in these old bones. Simon smirked. Spoken by the man who got himself captured. By a bunch of hicks, no less. Sure, go ahead and kick an old man when he's down. By the looks of it, the rednecks did all the kicking. Yeah, well, at least they couldn't make me any uglier. Simon let out a short chuckle. Can't argue with that. I gotta say, that was some shooting with the AA-12, Rawlings said, patting Simon on the back. Hey, you taught me everything I know. Rawlings grinned. It's good to know you were paying attention back in the day. Sometimes I wasn't 100% sure. Simon decided to change the subject. He had an important question to ask. What are you doing in the field, Nate? You have men for this. Rawlings hesitated before he spoke in a solemn voice. I think you already know. Simon was pretty sure he did. You don't trust Anderchuk or his men. Exactly. Decided to handle it myself. Well, I'm glad you did. Otherwise, I might have lost some of these kids. I'm not so sure about that. All I did was land on the boy. It was enough, trust me. Fair enough. So, our old pal Hanson, huh? Rawlings nodded. I know how much you hate the man, but we need to find him. Yeah, I came to the same conclusion myself. How, may I ask? With the help of these amazing kids... They've uncovered some key facts that I'll need to bring you up to speed on, but we can do that later, when we get back to their camp. Right now, we've got more pressing things to handle. What can I do to help? Grab Slayer and get these bodies loaded in the back of one of the trucks while I go have a chat with the elders. I need to apologize for all this bloodshed and try to smooth things over before we head out. Anything else? Simon nodded. When the healer's done with Cat and Diesel, I need you to take the girls back to their farm and keep them safe until I meet you there. Consider it done. The boys and I will go bury these assholes in the forest somewhere. Then, we'll need to find the rest of the crew and figure out what's next. We need to get prepared. With the power out and technology useless, it's gonna get ugly out there. And soon, Rawlings added. Well, folks... That concludes part two of the Lethal Rain series. Now before you ask, the answer is yes. This story will continue with more installments. However, the author has to first write them, then turn them over to me, so I can launch them on this channel. So it might be a little while, as truly unique stories take time to craft and get just right. Therefore, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel, so you'll be notified when the next release happens. Until next time, take care my friends. Remember. Not everything around you is what it appears to be. That's even more true when you're a character in one of Mr. Falconer's stories.